Uh, can uh, somebody hear me, see me? Yes, Girish, we can see you and we can hear you. Okay, great. So I'm going to see if uh, I can uh, run that PPT on this laptop. So I'm going to see if uh, I No, the narration is not audible. Hi everyone, can you hear me? I cannot hear anybody. Yes, we can hear you. Yes, okay. 
I got him. Thanks. You could you also see my screen just few seconds back? Ah uh, yes, I was able to see your screen at least. No, I am not. Ah uh, no, I I unshared it. I just wanted to check. Hello, am I audible? Just checking. This is Anup Krishnan here. Yeah, Om Damani here. From yeah. Bombay. Yeah, we can hear you. I have made you a co-host, so you can share the screen. Share oh. the screen. Girish, we can hear you. It's a bit scraggy, but uh, we can hear you. So, Jasdeep, can we start or should we wait a little more? Uh, I think we should start because uh, let me just make sure that the speakers are mostly in. Uh, they are. So, uh, all right. Welcome, everyone. Uh, this is Jasjeet Bagla from Aisa Mohali. And uh, we are uh, happy to host the first uh, online symposium from ISRC. This one is on modeling for uh, COVID-19 in the Indian context. Uh, I'll pass on the mic to uh, Pinaki, who will uh, take, uh, no, I, I think I pass on to Jam, and then on to Pinaki. Jam, are you here? Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Jasjit. Uh, I'll just uh, speak a couple of words about ISRC before we start. Uh, this is the Indian scientists' uh, response to COVID-19 group. Uh, uh, it came together uh, uh, towards the end of March as a voluntary group of, uh, started off with very few people and uh, many people from various institutions, uh, from various disciplines and universities joined and uh, it has grown to uh, be a large group with about uh, 600 members actually right now. Uh, we have working groups on uh, uh, different topics and people break into groups and work. One of them is modeling and this is the group that is organizing this meeting. Uh, we have another group called Hoaxbusters, which has been uh, looking at uh, fake news in the media and debunking it and producing resources. Then we have a group uh, on science communication, which tries to produce uh, material, especially for people in very low resource conditions. and. Uh, for different target audience. Uh, 
uh, we have a group uh, otherwise also looking at uh, uh, different uh, material and media. We have a group looking at hardware and we are active on social media. So please visit uh, the ISRC website, which we'll put up in chat and uh, welcome you all to this meeting. Thank you. Over to Pinaki. Yeah, so good afternoon and welcome to this first event in the series of symposia that we plan to have. So the idea is that we'll have uh, all the, I mean, most of the groups which are working on modeling how epidemic is spreading in the country to come together and give uh, their presentation on how they are looking at modeling. So there's a wide range of groups that are working throughout the country and the plan was to bring uh, some set of them together today. So we will hear a wide uh, variety of modeling that is being done from the different perspectives. And we have a great bunch of speakers to talk about that. So I'll introduce the speakers, but before that, I'll just remind the speakers that uh, it's about everybody has 20 minutes. So roughly 15 minutes for presentation and five minutes for questions. So after each presentation, there'll be a Q&A and the questions I request the audience to uh, post on the chat box. So we'll pick up some of the questions from there and then uh, we'll, the presenter can respond to that. So after we finish all the presentations, there will be a brief panel discussion. And uh, so the speakers can exchange their views on how to go forward, specific questions to look at. And we'll also take a few questions from the audience, again, via the chat box. And uh, if you have any extensive thoughts to share, please send us private, me private message, either to me or Jagjit, uh, and then we'll take it up from there. So the speakers for today are Mukund Thaktai from NCBS Bangalore, N. Anuprishnan from IIT Delhi, Gautam Menon from Ashok University, Sonpat, and also at IMSC Chennai, Om Damani from IIT Bombay, Sai Bignanan Pati from IIT Bombay, Girish Setlu from IIT Gohati, and Rajesh Sundarasan from ISC Bangalore, Harshal Hayat Nagarkar from ThoughtWorks. So uh, from white uh, variety of speakers and from different parts of the country, hopefully we'll have a wonderful discussion. So I request Mukun to kick off proceedings and he'll be talking about spread of COVID-19 in India at successive geographical scales. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Pinaki. Thank you, Jem. And uh, thank you, first of all, for inviting me to speak at the symposium. I think it's very important that uh, we're able to um, share the work that we're doing so rapidly um, and with large numbers of people through this uh, platform that's been built over just very few weeks. <clears throat> uh, first of all, I just want to check uh, if people can see my slides. Yes, we can. Okay, great. So uh, I'll get started. So uh, what my role here is, uh, what I've been trying to do is not to make predictions about uh, where this pandemic is going, but I think it's very important for us to understand what we are going through right now. In other words, to look back and see whether the patterns that have already occurred, and given the data that are available, uh, match what we expect from our basic understanding of how diseases um, spread. Um, so I'm going to be speaking in particular about the spread of COVID-19 in India uh, across multiple geographic uh, scales, starting at the level of the individual and going up all the way to the level of the country. So um, to begin with, uh, of course, the, the infection arrived in India uh, from abroad and um, the first set of uh, cases that were known because of the way the testing uh, criteria were determined were all international travelers or their primary contacts. Um, and these were uh, contact tracing was carried out by local authorities throughout the country. And over the period uh, from the uh, beginning of March to the very end of March, up till March 31st, um, there was a, a, a total of uh, about 500 international travelers who um, tested positive and whose contacts were traced. Um, about 462 of them uh, did not uh, cause any known infection and the rest cause infections according to this little um, graph that I showed. So each red point is an international traveler, each gray point is a local contact who was infected. You can actually use this graph to plot the probability that a given infected person infects a certain number of secondary cases. That's the histogram shown on the right. And this histogram um, is well fit by a negative binomial distribution, uh, which is a standard type of distribution to account for the idea of super spreading. Um, so what is super spreading? So if you assume that the uh, uh, basic reproduction number is 2.5, uh, then given the negative binomial fit to the contact data, 
um, you expect about uh, 80%, 78% of uh, infected people not to cause any further infection. On the other hand, about 10% will uh, seed seven or more infections. And these are called super spreading events because it's much more than you expect from a sort of homogeneous Poisson distribution type of assumption of how infections spread. Um, going to a slightly higher scale now, or all the way. Um, so by March 31st, we know and have traced a certain number of uh, uh, international travelers and their contacts. And if you just mark the total number of international cases known uh, in every state on March 31st, which remember is a few days after the lockdown, but cases have a lag of coming in. So I assume this still reflects pre-lockdown dynamics. And if you plot that in the left graph against all cases uh, on March 31st, which is in dark blue, or on April 26th, which is in orange, you see that on March 31st, there's a very tight correlation. Uh, which means that basically it's the imported cases that are driving the uh, epidemics locally. But by April 26th, there's a huge amount of divergence between states. I've shown similar data on the right, except now it's the number of districts that had international cases on March 31st, and the total number of cases by April 26th. And you can see that there are basically two kinds of things. One is a set of states that don't have an epidemic now, and the other is a set of states that do. There is a correlation with uh, imported cases, but remember this is just a correlation. It's very likely that large states will have many more imported cases simply because they have more international travel and so on. So this is not meant to be a causal statement. But I will say that the number of imported cases on March 31st is uh, a very good summary of future predictions um, of uh, infection, at least up to some point before the states diverge. So then my goal was to understand why did the states diverge um, in their dynamics? Why did some states like Karnataka and Kerala uh, go up by just a few factors from their uh, very high caseload. In fact, Karnataka and Kerala um, and uh, Bombay in particular uh, were the highest number of cases on March 31st. And yet now they are uh, in the bottom half of all states. Whereas states like Maharashtra, uh, Gujarat, Rajasthan um, zoomed up from a very low uh, starting point. So to understand this, uh, we need a model. And I'm going to present my modeling framework here and I'm happy to take discussions offline um, or later about how this works, but very, very quickly. You can write down the total number of infections, uh, I of T, um, in the following integral type of equation. It depends on the number of initial infections, depends on the rate of new infections, which is the product of the number of sensitive people, S, the current number of infected people, I, a prefactor beta, and the so-called infection kernel, which says the probability of somebody infecting somebody else at time T, given that they were infected themselves at time T prime. Um, this uh, fairly complicated way of writing things actually reduces right down to the basic SIR model, whose differential equation I've shown on the bottom. If you assume that this infection kernel phi is of the simple exponential form e to the minus alpha t. So what I've shown as this big complicated integral equation on top is actually just the SIR model if you take phi as e to the minus alpha t. However, if you want to uh, include more details, for example, like the SEIR model, which accounts for a certain amount of uh, infection after exposure before symptoms and so on, you can actually modify phi uh, to take into account all this data. Here I've shown an example where phi has a sort of Gaussian uh, shape, which is peaking at around five days. Um, so I'm going to use for the rest of this talk, um, the infection kernel shown over here, which was reported in science from contact tracing data. Uh, and it basically says that the peak of probability that someone infects somebody else is happening at around five days. Um, with a standard deviation of about two days and a fairly reasonable Gaussian shape by about uh, two weeks uh, after infection, the transmission probability is assumed to be low. Um, so that's the infection kernel. And that's why it's useful to write down the model in terms of the infection kernel, because you can account for all these details of viral dynamics. But there's another useful reason, and I want to go over that in detail here. This is the whole model. So we want a model spread in a country of a billion people, but we want to start with a single individual. Um, the only way to do this is a hierarchical model, right? So I'm going to assume a sort of scale unit of uh, two to the five, 32, or about 30. So I'm going to assume that individuals have a social group of about 30. Uh, about 30 groups make a locality of about 1,000. Localities make wards of about 30,000. Wards make districts of a million. Uh, states of 30 million, reaching up to a country of a billion. And we're going to try and model the spread across all these levels. And the way we're going to do this is, in fact, drawn from the mathematics. Just as two patients, two, one individual can infect another through some infectivity kernel, one group can infect another through contacts by relative individuals. But the infectivity kernel of the group is slightly different. In the same way, one district can infect another through contacts by individuals between those districts. And what I've shown in this little graph here 
is the calculated infectivity kernel going up and up and up across geographic scales. So what you see is basically that the process slows down at higher geographic scales and the peak of infectivity actually drops, not too much, but drops below what you would expect at the level of an individual because of the way the uh, disease decorrelates across a group. Uh, to be specific, uh, the kernels are actually calculated from the equation I told you earlier. The kernel at level K is the infection number at level K minus one, and I'm happy to discuss this further. The model essentially has only three parameters. One is not even a parameter, it's the, it's the scale of the units, which I'm saying is about 30, 32. The other parameter is the basic contact uh, rate, beta, which is part of the standard SIR model, for example, the bare contact rate. The final parameter is very important. It says the probability that my contacts are clustered within my social group or in my neighborhood, locality, ward, district, state, and so on. And I'm assuming that's going to take an exponential or a geometric type of profile. So I have successfully, successively fewer contacts at larger and larger geographic scales. And I'm going to assume a value of uh, 0.1 for that uh, reduction. And that lambda is basically the only free parameter of the model. Um, and the reason is because the beta, the contact rate, is uh, chosen so that the basic reproduction number, R0, comes to 2.5, which is a sort of standard agreed upon um, uh, amount uh, for COVID. So you can actually use this model, uh, and you can use it to predict when a, a starting infection from one individual, after how many days, will it first hit another ward that the individual is not in, or another district the individual is not in, or another state the individual is not in. Um, and that's plotted on the left here. So you can see that obviously the wards get hit early in the same state, in the same district, and then districts in the same state, and then other states. And there is a spread. Um, again, a very important point that the infection slows down as you have to reach successive scales. And there's a very interesting sort of two wave uh, pattern at the level of districts and states, which is not a, uh, apparent at the level of very local geography of the ward. Um, the, the total infections in each uh, uh, geographic zone, because of the way uh, the model is set up, of course, will reach a fraction which is consistent with R0, basically one minus one over R0. Okay, so I'm going to spend the remaining six minutes uh, discussing how this model actually uh, matches with data. I'll just remind you, uh, it has basically one free parameter, which is this assumption of how contacts decrease at successive geographical scales. The other parameter 2.5 for R0 is chosen from data and the infectivity kernel of a given patient is chosen from data, right? So this is not a fit that I'm showing. First, I want to show you the data. Um, so you can actually obtain this data from um, the, the COVID-19 tracker project, which I cited in my first slide. Um, so you can get day-by-day uh, -day district wise tallies for new cases and uh, similarly state by state. What I've shown you here is for 12 states, uh, which have the largest uh, infection so far. In, in gold color is the cumulative number of infections for the state. And in, in light and dark blue are infections total in early and late districts. I haven't put the names of the districts here, but I can tell you what they are uh, if somebody's interested. The pattern that you see is that you see early districts rise, then with some delay, you see late districts. And that delay is reflected in the total number of infections at the state level as well, because you see this kink in the growth rate of that state at the time when the late districts take over. The pattern is slightly different when the first district that gets hit is one of the largest districts, right? So that's the case, for example, in Tamil Nadu or Karnataka, where it's Chennai and Bangalore. But it is especially visible when the first district is small and the later districts are large, you see this crossover event and a sort of sigmoidal shape for the total number of infections in the state. The same pattern because of the hierarchical nature of uh, the interaction should be visible at the national scale as well. So I plotted uh, the data over here. Um, in dark brown is the total cumulative cases in India for the dates shown. In gold, the cases for Maharashtra, and then for the two early and late districts in Maharashtra, which are uh, Pune and Mumbai. Late is of course a relative term. There are still many districts that are much later in the in the course of the infection. So what you see here is that uh, the kinks that are visible in the Maharashtra uh, trajectory are also visible at some level in the India trajectory. Uh, and again, that's because there are early states like Haryana or uh, Kerala, and then there are late states like Gujarat. Um, on the right, I've shown the model whose only free parameter I've chosen as 0.1 just to be reasonable, it's not a fit. And you can see a, a, a rather a remarkable agreement qualitatively uh, in the countrywide uh, progression here, okay? It's not an exponential growth curve. It's not even a straight line. The countrywide growth curve shows 
these uh, oscillating patterns that reflect the first arrival in a ward, a district, a state, a country. And I hope you can see that the national data do match that kind of oscillating pattern. Uh, to re-emphasize the point, uh, I want to show you here, not the cumulative, but actually the number of cases per day, the rate of increase. And I've shown it on the left for days since March 1st, and I've shown it for India in dark brown and for Maharashtra in uh, orange. Uh, and on the right, the same model, the same um, uh, parameters, it's not a fit. Um, you can see that uh, the state-wise uh, orange pattern, there's a kink for early days, and then there's going to be an upswing, which is not yet visible in the Maharashtra chart, and that's for later districts of Maharashtra. But in the country, there is a kink, and then there is an upswing which corresponds to later states of the country joining the wave. And again, you see a rather remarkable qualitative agreement in the patterns of these curves. I want to point out right now, this model is not a fit. It's not a prediction either. You should not take the numbers of the model seriously. You can already see that the numbers in the model are an order of magnitude or more off from the numbers in the data. And this is a question. Um, about why there is a discrepancy. I haven't modeled the lockdown and that's part of the reason. Could also be lack of data. But the numbers should not be meaningfully compared. That's not my goal here. What you should take away from this message is the idea of early districts and states and then late districts and states and a characteristic wave which seems to be indeed visible in the real uh, data. Okay, so I'm going to um, end now so that there's enough time for questions with some open questions. Uh, first of all, I haven't modeled the lockdown. I've, my goal was just to see, you know, what is the null model taking what is known about biology of the virus and seeing how it fits into a hierarchical setting in India. Okay, so it's not a fit to the data. And how to put the lockdown into this framework to explain the discrepancy of the two numbers is something that will need to be worked out. The second thing, which is very interesting to me, if you try and bring the total numbers down to match the data, it also slows down uh, the spread. In other words, the time scale and the total amounts are related. Um, and it's actually difficult to find mechanisms that control just one versus the other. So there is something interesting going on in the real data, uh, which is not accounted for in a simple one parameter model, obviously. And so the model will need to be made more complicated to account for lockdown. The final word is that absolutely the most important thing here is that lambda drop-off rate as a function of geographic scale. How many contacts do I have in my group, in my locality, in my ward, in my district, in my state, right? For most people, most contacts are within groups and localities like employers and fewer and fewer, exponentially fewer contacts going up. But that drop off is what's controlling the dynamics as you see here. And therefore things like inter-district and interstate travel will be expected to have a very large um, impact. So um, I've reached my 15 minutes, I'll stop over here. Just want to acknowledge um, we have a very interesting and dynamic modeling group uh, operating within TIFR. Uh, with a lot of my colleagues uh, who've already uh, put together a lot of studies and preprints on this. And I'm amazed to see how fast the science is going and how fast we're able to share, exchange, and critique our data. Uh, at my own institution, NCBS, uh, thanks to uh, Sandeep and Madan for inputs and uh, to Dilawar for helping me with the data. Um, again, for discussions at JNC SR, SR uh, Srikant Shastri and early discussions um, and a, a lot of um, just basic conversation um, with uh, Gautam has been very useful in helping me learn about how to do all this. So I'll stop there and uh, I'll take questions. Thank you. Well, thanks a lot for being on time. So a couple of questions to begin with from Carl Brito. So is population density a parameter in these models? And also rates of testing increased with time. Could you explain some of the kinks? Could that explain some of the kinks that you mentioned? Yeah, so remember, uh, I'm not trying to explain the data. I'm just taking a very simple model, making a prediction, see how it fits with data. This being keeping with the philosophy of a null hypothesis. The goal is not to add so much detail as to be able to explain all the kinks. Uh, and the summary is that you can get the kinks with no further input. Population density, it's absolutely an, uh, arising effectively in the model. What the model has are numbers, right? But the fact that the interactions are higher within your local group and slightly lower in your locality and so on and so forth, um, that captures some idea of local population interactions. If the question is about heterogeneity in density between different regions, that heterogeneity is not in the model. It assumes a uniform type of uh, self-similarity um, at all nodes and at all levels. Yeah, I think this is also related to the next question from Mithun, which he asks that if I understand correctly, the infection kernel is obtained by fitting to data at the appropriate level. Is this done for each district or each state individually, or is there some average kernel at a given level? 
Again, the infection kernel is not done by fitting. What you do to the, the uh, in my talk, there are two separate threads. One is the data and one is the model. And the model is not fit to data. The infection kernel starts off with one patient's infection kernel. You put that into the model, into the uh, integral equation that I showed you to find out how many infected people I get in a, a locality. You put that back in to get how many infected people you get in a district and so on. Those uh, calculations are how you get the, infective, uh, the infection kernel. I don't fit to the data at any point. I just have one pre-parameter, which is lambda. The next question is uh, from Chandran Venkateswaran. Looks like that the late districts show more cases eventually than the early districts. Any idea why, or is it that just a coincidence? Okay, so here, when I showed you the graph of late districts, okay, here, in the, on the right, it's the sum of all the late districts, okay? So it's one early district plus the remainder, and the sum of those two uh, should match the whole state in the model. Uh, now, if you look at the data, um, the, the patterns are slightly different uh, for uh, states where the early districts were small and the late districts were large, um, uh, or for states, uh, for example, uh, like uh, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, where the first districts are large, okay? So uh, by just looking at the variation in the district size, you should be able to reconcile what the patterns look like over here. It's not that the late districts cause more cases. Eventually all districts reach the same saturation number, which is one minus one over R. And because that, that, uh, uh, that's the so-called herd immunity uh, threshold. It's the fact that there's only one early district, but many late districts waiting in the wings that causes the crossover. So some people are asking about the definition of early and late districts. It's just when the infection is hitting each district, right? It's when the infection hits each district. Uh, very strictly early is the first district uh, and late are all the others. And when the infection reaches all the others is given by uh, this graph on the left. If it hits the first district on day zero, then the, the other districts, which are all counted as late, uh, start at around 25 so we'll take our last couple of questions. So, uh, so from Vijay Jindal, we always talk about number of infected persons. My question is, is there a parameter to identify severity factor leading to mortality link? Okay, so of course, I'm not going to model mortality and so on. It's not that type of detailed model, but there are other people in the symposium who will bring that up. And so maybe we can wait for that question to be taken by uh, later speakers. So one more question maybe. Uh, so from Ajay Thakur, is there discrepancy in numbers between data and model due to one in n cases actually being reported, lockdown helping damn the number of infected and a combination of both A and B? Could be all of the above. It could also be that the model is exceedingly simple uh, and therefore we should not expect such a simple model to give detailed number agreement, only qualitative agreement. Thanks, Mukun. I think we should move on to the next speaker. So we'll come back to the discussion on your uh, talk later again. So next speaker is N. Anup Krishnan from IIT Delhi. Oh, so Anup, sorry. you can start. Yep. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me see how to go full screen. Okay, can you see my screen now? Yes. Perfect. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, giving me an opportunity to present our work, Prakriti. The title of today's presentation is Prakriti, a highly granular model for uh, COVID-19 for effective planning of control strategies. So for those uh, who are thinking what Prakriti is, Prakriti is an acronym that uh, we have come up with for prediction and assessment of corona uh, infections and transmissions in India. So we have a web page also, and uh, I'll be discussing about uh, this in detail. This work is done by a group of uh, PhD scholars and undergraduates and a few volunteers, uh, Ravinder Hargun, Saurabh Suresh uh, Amrin, mostly working with me and uh, in collaboration with uh, uh, Professor Hari Prasad Kodamana of uh, Chemical Engineering IIT Delhi and uh, Professor Amit Sharma of ICGB New Delhi. Great. Can you see my screen? Okay. 
Yes. Yes, yes, we can. We have all muted our mics, so don't worry okay, about sure, the sure. Yeah. sure, yeah. <clears throat> okay, so uh, I'll try to present it this way because uh, sometimes it's getting stuck when I'm doing pressing next with the with the full screen mode. So, so here we are together for uh, to discuss about COVID nineteen and some of the major issues the world is facing right now. So you can see that most of the world is already with. Uh, infected by COVID-19. So the major issues that the world is trying to address is one, estimating the nature of spread. There have been a lot of work on that. You saw an earlier model, a wonderful one by uh, Professor Mugun Tatai, and I'm sure we are going to see a few more. Um, second question is about control and mitigation strategies. So how to essentially balance between the burden on the economy versus the burden on the healthcare, healthcare system? And the third one is when you're planning any strategies for intervention, either at the local level or national level, what is the common metric that you can look for? So, I mean, there are many metrics that people are looking at. Uh, it's just number of infected cases, number of active cases, number of deaths, and many other uh, cases all, um, metrics also, but no commonly agreed metric for this. And then uh, another issue is about resource allocation. So where should you allocate the resources to, you know, hospitals, PPEs, and even other uh, food. And uh, you know, so as, uh, essentially resource allocation is also a major issue. So to address this, some of the common approaches that's taken right now is nationwide lockdown. Most of the countries have gone into nationwide lockdown. It's very effective in most of the countries, but it's not scalable in long term, as we can see in India also right now. Another one is a localized lockdown. That means you can locally you know, lock down a few regions. But the problem in this case is you have a large number of possibilities to decide from and how to go with which option is always a question. Great, so the, the, the goal of this work is to combine physics-based modeling with real-time data to enable development of some optimized uh, intervention strategies or at least to give some directions in those, uh, at least to shed some light in those uh, directions. Great, so let's uh, look at COVID modeling now. And you can see there have been a, quite a few publications on this. Uh, and one of the most commonly used approach is uh, SEIR based model. So I would like to just give a brief uh, idea about this. So you can basically model this uh, COVID either using a physics based model or a data driven model. So a data driven model is purely relying on data and in it, in, or not anything else. So machine learning based models or probabilistic models and regression based models can be examples of uh, uh, data driven models. But a more common one is physics based model. So that is SEIR based model or SIR based model and several versions of those. Or if you want to model it at a slightly more uh, granular scale, agent based models are something that you can look for. But some of the major issues that the models, uh, these models uh, present are models in many occasions do not consider the granularity in terms of spread. So the, if you do not consider the granularity in terms of spread, that may lead to significant, significant uh, overestimation. I'll discuss about that uh, a little later. Another one is the spatio-temporal variations in basic reprodu uh, reproduction number are not. So uh, uh, Mukun gave a very, very nice presentation earlier about SIR model and br brief idea about what is the mathematical um, equations behind this. But one of the common approaches that people always use is to keep a constant R0, a basic reproduction number. And uh, here what we will show in next few slides is that uh, the basic reproduction number R0 is going to pay, play a very key role in modeling this uh, the transmission. And specifically, uh, this uh, R0 exhibits a significant uh, 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 large spatio-temporal variations, even in uh, countries like Italy, which are significantly smaller than India. So to this extent, what we propose is we propose an adaptive interacting uh, cluster-based uh, SEIR model. We call it AIC-SEIR, AXER model, for predicting the granular transmission of uh, COVID-19 in India. Okay, so this is the basic idea of an SEIR model. So you saw these equations earlier uh, in the SIR model case. So here you just have an additional E coming into this that is exposed. 
so the basic idea is you take a population you divide it into four groups first you divide it into susceptible that's the, those people who are susceptible to infection and then you have exposed the ones that, that are exposed to infected people or at least exposed to the virus and then this exposed get converted to infected and uh, the infected finally get converted to removed so it, it could be recovered or it could be diseased great so this is the basic idea of a, of an seir model but what we specifically did in our aic seir model that is adaptive interacting cluster based uh, seir model is that we took the total population of of the country and then we divided this uh, total population into sub populations so how did we divide it so you can see a map of india here and then different states uh, which are part of the country so what we did is we took these states we took this geopolitical divisions and divided the total population into each of this sub populations now what we did is that once we have these sub populations we applied an scir model within each sub population so um, there are a few uh, tricks in this which i'll i'll be explaining in detail in the next few slides it's not the regular scir model but slightly modified version of it and in within each state what you do is you divide this uh, sub population as natives and people who are from another state or migrants so this is a little bit uh, tricky so the point of this is uh, to ensure that uh, you know infected people from one place move to another place the idea is as follows that let me uh, so for example i am right now staying in delhi but let's say i am uh, i am from some other state okay and during this infection i decide to travel from delhi to my state so i could be part of any of the four i could be part of s e i or r but i decide to move from my state to my uh, from the state that i am currently residing to my home state and if i belong to either e or i there is a high chance that i take the infection along with me and then initiate the infection in the new state that i am uh, going to which is my home state so that part is uh, accounted in this uh, model by dividing the total population into natives and migrants so in in our present case what we did is that we looked into the census data from last 10 years and what we found out is that on an average 10 to 15 percentage of uh, population in any state is a migrant population so we assumed uh, 10 percentage of the total population of a state to be migrant and uh, we assumed the rest of them to be natives now in this migrant also what we did is that we assigned a probability for each state and distributed it to to those states so this probability was taken basically considering a lot of factors for example what we did is we took the total population of a state we took the distance between the the capitals of the state so the assumption is that if i am uh, uh, if i am i'm basically from up i am more probable to go go to states closer to me than to go to a state that is further to me so so this uh, distribution of migrants is considered to be totally proportional to uh, inversely proportional to distance directly proportional to the number of metropolitan cities directly proportional to the population of the state and directly proportional to the number of tourists visiting a, a particular all these data is taken from the census uh, for last 10 years for indian indian scenario and then how do we have this interpopulation interaction so we have migration that is people leaving for hometown or you have people coming to hometown okay so for example if i am in delhi population i can leave delhi and somebody else can come into delhi also so this is where it becomes slightly different from the scir model because scir model traditionally assumes a clo close population here i am saying it's not a close population but people can freely move and irrespective of which state they are in that is an s e i or r great so this is about migration now uh, border control we add an additional term to account for border control which is in in addition to this migration term so this migration term tells me which state i am probable to go to if i am allowed to move now the border control tells me if i can move or not so this is again another parameter that uh, that we can uh, play around with according to different conditions of the government so let us say if you have a strict lockdown 
then you have c equal to zero and then if the borders are completely free then you have 100 percentage traffic They're just normal traffic going between the the boundaries so this is how the population clusters are interacting with each other and then you have an intra population interaction that means within the subpopulation how are they in, interacting to that we did not assume a constant r not but we computed the r not for each of the districts uh, sorry so for each of the population that is in this case states by fitting the incidence data with the sir model so what we did essentially is that we took initially we took sir model but then we understood that if you take sir model there is a slight issue because exposed is a major a major part of this population and that actually decides the nature of the curve because it's exponential it may start like this but if you allow for uh, seir model it can even go like this so uh, this we realize it over time so what we did is that we took the seir model and fitted the data r not to it uh, fitted the curve to it uh, from a in a least square sense and doing all the regular curve fitting methods um, and then computed the r not value for each of the sub populations so i am i was always uh, told that every equation you have in the slide takes n number of people away from the slide so i'm just not going to discuss this slide in detail i just wanted to show it to you because this is the seir model and this is the the district wise or state wise implementation of the seir model it's the same equation just that now you have it for each district okay so xii uh, xij yii yij wii ij nii nij and these are corresponding to the interaction within the district and with the other districts or states for example okay so this is the equation that we have implemented so for completion sake i'm just showing it okay great so we have a very nice model and i'm saying it is going to work well and all that so did we try it of course we tried it specifically we tried it in three countries we took italy we took us and we took india so here you can see how the scir model is fitting to r not so you can see the r square value is almost 1 because the curve is almost going on top of it uh, and what we see is that the r not in this case this is for state gujarat if you can see on the on the left this is for state uh, gujarat and the and the r not value is coming out uh, to be uh, 1.71 great so we did this for italy india and us and this is the distribution of r not values in italy usa and india uh, each each during different time period so let me just explain it the italy from february 24th to march 1st week that's when they had the initial cases us from march 4th to two weeks forward from march 4th and india from march 19th to week forward okay so this is the first few weeks of uh, heavy infection and what you can see that uh, the, the r not values of india is significantly lower in comparison to the r not values of italy and uh, usa and you can see i mean of course we are fitting it only for one week so there could be some spurious spurious fits but you can see that overall the r not value of italy is significantly high in march 9th okay and then you go forward 24th of march it's significantly decreased the color scheme is here it's going from 1 to 10 and then once you go one more week 5th april it significantly decreased and most values were close to 1 and in us you can again see the same thing that uh, you know in 18th march only very few states were affected so the gray gray ones correspond to the states where we have not computed or not and then when you go to the 5th of april you can see that the states are significantly affected and you know uh, different values of or not and this was the case for 4th april in india some of the states are not significantly affected so they are not included so what is the main message out of this a constant value of r not cannot be used either spatially or temporally okay so with this what we did is that we extracted these values of r not and then put them in into our aic seir model and then predicted the trajectory for uh, different states in different countries so here you can see we did it for calabria in italy idaho in usa madhya pradesh in india uh, veneto in italy washington in up and uh, washington in usa and uttar pradesh in india 
so interestingly what you see is that even for districts which had no initial cases that is what i0 equal to 0 means so this states had uh, basically no infections in the beginning and still our model is predicting uh, pretty well for this uh, these districts uh, these states as well similarly for idaho and madhya pradesh you can see these are all three states were which had no infection so in order for infection to start in this state it should move from one state where there is infection through our aic scr model reach an initial infection there and then start spreading it according to the uh, you know transmission dynamics there and similarly for other states which had uh, you know sizable number of initial population also our model is uh, predicting it uh, reasonably well great so now we move on to a comparison between scir model and our aic scir model so you can see if you have a single cluster scir model for the entire country it significantly overestimates both the peak and the time at which the peak occurs so here the dotted line corresponds to the aic scir xr model and the, the blue line corresponds to the single cluster model and you can see we have simulated it for different values of c c equal to 1 means completely free traffic c equal to 0.5 means absolutely you know reduced traffic basically 50% is the traffic and 0.1 means only 10% is the traffic of course we did not simulate it for c equal to 0 because we felt it to be a really un unrealistic scenario so this suggests that basically the xr model predicts the peak to be significantly lower and extending this further what it suggests is that if you have a lower uh, much more granular model the peak will be much much more diminished and more spread okay so so anup just okay. a reminder that you have only 3 4 minutes left for your 20 perfect minutes. yeah i'll be finishing in 3 4 minutes thank you so this is our granular r not in india what we did is that we just uh, took the same thing and then computed the r not in 30 states in india so you can see the r not varies from 0.07 to 3.38 if you consider the state wise model and then for 730 sorry it's not states it's districts please read it as districts so for 730 districts in india so you can see some the, the r not is mostly not uh, calculated for many districts because they have very few cases so even in this case you can see that uh, the 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 r not is varying from 0.03 to 5.45 then this is the histogram of the r not values for different weeks week 1 2 3 4 5 uh, where fifth week is the last week of april okay so we are starting from the last week of march to last week of april so you can see how the 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 r not is varying from states and the district wise cases and specifically if you look at the mean r not you can see this is the mean r not so if you look at the district wise model you can see that there is, this is con continuously decreasing and this can be completely attributed to lockdown so you see we start from a 5.5 value and then we go all the way down to 1 and while if you look at the states then you see slight increase and then decrease so this also suggests the the reason for using a, a more granular model instead of a, a model like this based on this we developed a dashboard called prakriti so it's a web based dash dashboard and it provide, provides provides uh, detailed state wise and district wise predictions of covid 19 it provides the basic reproduction number at a very granular level so you can all go to the website the website is prakriti.iitd.ac.in you can all go to the website i'll show it after the presentation uh, and then look at the r not values currently in each of the states and districts so if you have any comments or suggestion please uh, let us know we'll be glad to make any changes to this accordingly and this is really tailored for indian scenario you have you have 730 districts models and and the predictions is, are given for a three week period so we are not predicting it for the entire curve because it doesn't make sense to predict it for the entire curve but we are doing it for a three week period and every week we are updating it so the our next update is going to come tomorrow that is may 10th we will be updating the data and like this we will be updating it every week and the projections will be for three weeks forward and you can extract the r not value the district wise cases state level cases and the country level cases and we we strongly believe this enables authorities and public to plan intervention strategies and social location so the main conclusions r not exhibit significant spatio temporal variations which needs to be accounted in models and the exer model presented here can provide a very granular trajectory of covid 19 in india and potentially the rest of the world and finally the exer model allows the simulation of various intervention strategies at granular level thereby this 
allowing this policy makers to make an optimal choice balancing the long term socio economic burden and short term healthcare burden some things required for future work what are the data required we really need accurate district level data of testing and the number of cases and some of the model limitations is as i said we can predict it for short term in reasonably well but long term is not possible and it's not able to account for untested cases and that's why we need the testing data to basically add a parameter that can account for this some of the future work i we believe this model presented here is very generic and can be applied to other countries as well and other infectious diseases as well and there are many parameters that we have not included which is something like for example uh, population demography that is age and sex exact data on migrant workers seasonal variations of r not etc so before concluding i would like to thank uh, my collaborators and uh, students who worked on this i must say that ravinder one of the phd students working with me did most of the work on this i am just presenting his work it's really his hard work that you're seeing and of course hargun singh who developed the web page and the interface and everything the whole thing was done in a in a week's time so they really put in a lot of sleepless nights and of course i need to thank my collaborators professor hari prasad kodamana and professor amit sharma from icgb who gave uh, really really nice inputs on modeling with this i would like to conclude uh, my presentation and i'm just taking it to the web page uh, uh, prakriti uh, so so thanks anup yeah. because we are running out of time so i'll just uh, shoot off a couple of questions that come that have come in so one question is basically so how much how many free parameters do you have in the model and uh, so that is one question and another question maybe you can uh, answer is also uh, so in r not estimates how much whether you have uh, look uh, computed uncertainties and so on so these two questions yeah maybe. yeah so right right so uh, this has been extensively done and we have already written a paper on it so this is under review so if you go to this uh, you can see the r not values and the estimates in uncertainty and the goodness of fit is also given the r square values for most of the states so if you have low number of cases then you will see that the goodness of fit is very bad so in those cases we took the country average sorry the state average as a case for that district but uh, if we have a lot of cases then uh, the the r square fit is really good and the uncertainty associated with this is very low yeah, yeah i can give i have the entire uh, you know for all 730 districts we have the curve for it so i can share it with whoever is interested yeah and about the free parameters so how many free parameters do you have yeah so the number of free parameters is basically r not is a fitting parameter that's that's the main uh, free parameter that we have and another one is we initiate a matrix so in when you are initiating matrix what you are taking is we are taking the population and then we are distributing it so when you are distributing it we are assuming the 10 percentage is migrant population so that the that these are the two free parameters that uh, we have in our model okay so thanks a lot anup maybe we'll come back to your uh, discussion at the late, uh, later half so Absolutely. next i we... see that there are lots of uh, chats i'll go through yeah, probably sure. be able to give some answer towards the end of it thank okay. you thanks a lot so next uh, presentation is by gautam menon so gautam if you are ready we can start Is my screen visible? Yeah. Okay, fine. All right. There's a bit of a hitch there. Okay, so can I start? Yep. Okay, so I want to describe what we call the Insysim model. And this is work that's been done with the modeling group at Insycorp over the past two months, roughly. This work is available on the Insycorp, which is Indian Scientific Response to COVID-19 on the ISRC page. And it's currently in the form of two reports, one put out on April 18th, one on May 5th, just a few days ago. And the first one describes the model that I'm going to tell you about now. The second looks at a particular application. which is to the question of what is the best way to emerge from a lockdown situation what is the best way to relax a lockdown accompanying these two presentations is also a dashboard which is the insight sim dashboard where you can try many of these things on your own try a simulation for how as you impose different 
types of, of interventions, for example, a periodic lockdown, a single lockdown, et cetera. And you include factors like the migration between cities, the migration between states, et cetera. You can change or vary the answer, which is actually, and as well as the stringency with which we impose any of these constraints. So what we wanted to do in the beginning was to provide a state-of-the-art compartmental model for COVID-19 spread in India and its states and its districts. So that was the, the sort of dominating theme of what we wanted to do. As part of this, we wanted to look at what might, what might be thought of as benchmark rates for modeling. I mean, models require specifications of rates and the more complicated the model is, the more rates they take in. Many of these rates relate to biological parameters and they can be refined further as we know more and more about the patient's sequence through this disease, so the etiology of the disease. We wanted to include demographics, that is state population and details about migration. In particular, what we wanted to do was to be able to evaluate what are called non-pharmaceutical interventions. For example, lockdown, staggered lockdown, periodic lockdown, et cetera, et cetera, light switch lockdown and so on, and see which might work best in which particular context. Then we wanted to provide an online tool so that people could actually test all of this out on their own, exactly has been done in, in the earlier talk as well, as well as to make easy updates possible and changes whatever we did to the code, we also wanted to make that transparent. So let me describe the difference between the standard SEIR model and the more complex model that we're talking about now. So the SEIR model, as you learn both from Mukun's talk as well as from Nukrishna's talk, is a susceptible, exposed, infected, and recovered States. What we wanted to replace it by is something a little more that truly is representative of an individual patient's trajectory through the disease. So everyone starts off in an exposed state once they're infected. So you have a susceptible compartment. The moment you're infected, you move into an exposed compartment. And from there, depending upon, depending upon your age, your predisposition to disease, your other types of conditions that you might have and so on, you can be either mildly ill, in which case you move from the exposed to a pre-symptomatic category for about two days, and then to a mildly ill category for about a five or six more days, and then to a recovered category. If you're severely ill, you move from exposed to a pre-symptomatic category, to a symptomatic category, which is a serious symptomatic category, a severe symptomatic category, and from there to a hospitalized category, and there to recovered. If you're critically ill, you move from the exposed to the pre-symptomatic, to the severe, to the hospitalized, and then you have two options, either that you move to a death compartment or a recovered compartment. And in addition to all this, there is the asymptomatic trajectory, which is infected. So you move to the exposed compartment, to the asymptomatic compartment, where you can infect other people, and from there to the recovered compartment. And what you have on, on the x-axis at the bottom of the graph below is the number of days, the progression of the disease through the number of these days. And you can see that the lengths of these compartments roughly reflect what is known from the etiology of the disease itself of COVID-19. You can translate this. So this is the model that has been appeared in various forms. And the form that we saw it in was a form that Mordecai at Stanford had, had written it down. You can convert this into the standard compartmental description that people use when they write down equations that describe how people move from compartment to compartment. So the S compartment, the E compartment, so you move from S to E at a rate beta. So that's the fundamental rate in, 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 in this model and beta related to the reproductive ratio that you heard about. From the exposed compartment, you can fork out into either being asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic. From there, you can move from pre-symptomatic, you can move to the mildly symptomatic and then to the recovered state, or you can move to the severely symptomatic, to the hospitalized, and then to the dead state or the recovered state. So all of these arrows between these compartments illustrate specific trajectories through the disease that you can tune based upon the rates that I described a little earlier. There's an addition to the arrows, to the dark arrows with, with the various Greek symbols involved that tell you how exactly the branching happens and what are the rates at which you move from compartment to compartment. You'll also see a dotted line with the, with the notation CS, CP, CA, and CM. So these reflect the contacts, the effective contacts that lead, that take infected people and connect them to susceptible people. This is important because you can choose different interventions that target, for example, the symptomatically infected versus the asymptomatically infected or the pre-symptomatically infected and vary these CS, CP, CA, and CM independently. And I will tell you exactly how we use these to implement certain types of interventions in the model. So as I said, the Cs represent the intensity of contacts and tuning these Cs is a non-pharmaceutical intervention because you're just controlling the rate at which people interact with each other. The products of the Cs and the betas together determine R and that's, that's what sort of makes the situation a little more complicated. Reducing R is equivalent to a lockdown. Reducing Cs, you can think of in many ways. If you imagine that you can change Cs with time from being strong in the beginning to weak at the end. 
That's like a system in which you can immediately test and quarantine people who test positive and remove them from the general population, thereby weakening the link between the infected and the susceptible. So that's, it's really manipulating the betas and the Cs that enable us to look at different interventions in these particular contexts. So the model parameters are described on the top left. Again, it's just a question of detail and you can get these off the, the website if you want to look at it. The, the schema of the model is in the bottom left-hand corner and the equations themselves are to the bottom right-hand corner. So now you can see that instead of having four compartments, which is the SCIR is traditionally written, you now have nine compartments and these rates describe the transition between each of these compartments. Each of these compartments can further be subdivided according to age structure. So you can have zero to 10, 10 to 20, 20 to any number of age compartments that you have. You can also generalize these to have at-risk structure as well. For example, some fraction of the population could be at risk because of pre-existing condition. You could also put that into the model by tuning these parameters appropriately. So this is a meta-population model. So in, we started off by describing this for states and cities. Now it's a model at the level of districts. It's an age structured model currently, although some of the results that I will describe will not bother about age structure, we'll just assume that the population is homogeneous. It incorporates migration, the ability to move from state to state. It incorporates healthcare accessibility in its current version, although it isn't there in the earlier set of slides. You can look at the population that is unable to access healthcare or hospital. Connections between these, the compartments that I described, that accounts for this. Something that we plan to do a little further on is to look at healthcare metrics and look at the quality of healthcare district-wise with an addition of some health economics input at that point. For cities, we've looked at, again, metapopulations of cities for migration, the network of 318 cities and how they transfer people from one to the other. If cities are connected, if there is a direct link between these cities, we call them as connected, as connected nodes. And we look at migration along these nodes. The migration is balanced, that is, there is no net population change across these different components. So there is no net amount of people leaving Delhi, say, to go to Bombay, but we can change that as time goes along. So what we do in these calculations is make a couple of assumptions. The first is that you have to assume values of exposed, pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic people in the population. These are hardest to estimate because there is really no way in which we have of actually doing this unless you, you sort of, you have a population in which you manage to test everybody to try and estimate, to try and find out how many are asymptomatic within that. So we choose a range based on the number of positive cases and what we understand from the data that is coming out. We spend some amount of time looking at reproductive ratios, the beta parameter that I told you about. So right now we assume these, we either take them for granted, the sort of spirit that, that Mukund had, had used in the beginning, a 2.5 value. We take somewhere between 1.6 and 2.4, depending upon the situation that we're trying to model. Or we can use it in a, in a somewhat more sophisticated way using models such as the epistem model, where, as well as Bayesian techniques, either methods one and four of the Imperial College techniques, toolbox of techniques to estimate the reproductive ratio. This you take in time series for daily incidence and serial interval statistics in order to estimate values for the current reproductive ratio of India. This is not the basic reproductive ratio, but what it is currently at the level of after interventions have taken place. So right now for 6th May, our calculations give you a number of about 1.55 for India and for Maharashtra 1.54 for 24. And we will use this number a little later to make certain predictions for Maharashtra. Um, so I'm going to use a bunch of different examples. I'll take Maharashtra as an example. Also Tamil Nadu, Chennai, Pune, all of different examples of the sorts of things that we do. We start with a certain number of infected people, exposed people, with a total population of about 11 crores, which is representative of Maharashtra. We have no initial hospitalized, dead or recovered cases. We simulate lockdown by reducing the value of beta to a value of R0, which is less than, which is around one, maybe a little less or maybe a little more. We think of imposing a lockdown on the 30th day, a single lockdown lasts for 30 days, and then you can impose a sequence of periodic lockdowns for seven days, a five-day break, a repeating seven days, five-day break, et cetera. We alter the C parameters in terms, we interpret them in terms of quarantining and testing of different people. And you assume that because it's just so hard to identify asymptomatic in the population without identifying them from within the, the primary and the secondary contacts of someone who's already infected, the time scales for dealing with asymptomatics is assumed to be larger, twice as large as the time scales for, for dealing with symptomatic cases. Okay, so that's the, that reflects some additional difficulty in identifying asymptomatic cases compared to symptomatic cases. Okay, so run this program, what do you get? The first thing is that the initial number of cases that you start off, it doesn't matter, this is known. All, you, all that number does is to shift the start of the epidemic peak. So the smaller the number is, the more shifted to the right is, but the value of the peak 
continues to remain the same. So that doesn't alter the number of the number of people who are actually getting infected. So in a sense, that is good because it says that the numbers that you get at peak are not altered by any mistakes that you might make in your starting configuration. Those numbers are the same irrespective. If you change again standard results, if you change the infectivity, if you change R0, that has the effect of flattening the peak. And you can look at a bunch of different R0 and imagine how the peak is flattened and how it shifts outwards. So all of these are standard results just to check that everything is going okay. Now you can ask if you implement testing and quarantining on a population like this, what happens to the peak? And over here in these figures, this, the, the dark shade that you can see at the back represents the untested case where you just let the epidemic run through without imposing any type of, of, of intervention. Okay, so in this case, the two curves that you see are with different protocols of testing and quarantining. One is a faster protocol in which we assume that you can test and quarantine a larger fraction of the population, say spread over 100 or 150 days. And the other is and, and 100, 150 and 200 days. So these are the typical examples that we take. And you can see that the weaker, the more you spread it out, the more it peaks, the larger the number of people who are infected are, but it's still much less than the number that you would get if you didn't intervene at all. If you impose a lockdown and you ask what happens, what happens is that you just manage to shift the peak. You don't affect it at all because no lockdown is ever really truly effective unless you manage to have it last for at least 180 days or 200 days and you manage to identify every single possible case within that limit. And you also don't allow for anyone who, to come in from outside. So all that lockdowns do is to really postpone the inevitable in terms of the number of cases. And that's again an example of, of, what, of what that sort of epidemiological law actually works out to in this complicated model that I described to you. If you do lockdowns with quarantining and testing, then you manage to reduce the peak again significantly. So I had a number of about 60 lakhs earlier for the number of infected. I've now pushed it down to about 30 lakhs. If I have a lockdown and I couple that lockdown with the sequence of quarantining and testing, and depending upon the stringency with which I impose my quarantining and testing, I can push it down to fairly small levels. If it's the less stringent it is, that is to say the larger, the longer the time over which you spread it out, the larger the number of cases that you will wind up with. You can imagine different types of lockdowns. So one lockdown was just switch, switch, switch the lockdown off, relax it and let things go back to normal and accompany that with, with quarantining and testing after the lockdown. You can also impose a lockdown in a light switch way, which means that you, you, the moment the number of infected cases crosses a certain limit, you impose a lockdown again, then wait for it to go down. If it rises up and crosses again, then you switch it off again. So you can impose this, this threshold behavior by which you immediately tamp down and impose a lockdown if you have a threshold number of infected, and then you can see what happens to that. And this certainly reduces the peak, but it's not optimal in terms of the next scenario, which I will describe, which is a periodic lockdown. You impose a lockdown for seven days, relax it for five days, seven days, five days, seven days, five days. And together with testing and quarantining, you can both delay the peak as well as reduce the number of hospitalizations. So now I've taken you through a bunch of different interventions that we have looked at so far in the first part of our work, all of which look at imposing different timescales for lockdown, the light switch lockdown, a periodic lockdown, and as well as coupled to quarantining and testing, which has its own timescale over which you can manage to successfully test a large fraction of the population. And the real message that you should take from here, which I will emphasize again later, is that testing and quarantining is absolutely crucial to being able to deal with the disease. You can now look, for example, at Chennai, this is a typical city, and ask what happens with quarantining and testing when you apply it to Chennai. So the no interventions curve is on the left, and that's where you, num you change the number of initial infected cases between about 10 and 460. Again, all that happens is that you shift the curves, and all of these curves overlap a little bit. So it's a little smudged out, that particular curve here. But if you impose quarantine testing on top of that, and fairly weakly, that's over a scale of about a year, you can see that there's a huge reduction in the numbers of people who are infected. So quarantine testing at the level of a city of a smaller population, which in principle is well, can be well handled, has a large effect on controlling the number of cases that you might have. If you reduce that, that period from, two, from 360 days to 240 or 120, you really tamp down on that number. So if you can manage to ramp up quarantine testing over a period of about 120 days, the hospitalized numbers that you expect never cross more than about 450 to 500. You can see it peak, it increased during the lockdown period, then come down again. And then as you relax the lockdown, as the quarantine testing takes over post lockdown, you can see that number never, never really rises. Even compared to having a longer period of quarantine testing, 240, it's way reduced. So the numbers are about 500 compared to about 12,000 in that particular case. We then began to look at many more different types of lockdowns. 
So one lockdown that you can look at is what is called a periodic synchronous lockdown, where you allow 100% of the population to work for N days and then lock them down for N days. For example, if N is two and M is four, you can imagine everyone going to work for work, work for the first two days, then be locked down for four days, work for, for, the, for the next two days, be locked down for four days. The second way you could do this is to have a staggered workforce. So imagine that 33% of the population works for N days and then goes to lockdown for two N days. For example, I can have G1, G1 going on the first two days, G2, the second group, G2 working on the, on the next two days, G3 working on the following two days, and then G1, the cycle then repeating. So this is periodic because it repeats itself. It's asynchronous because not all groups are there at the same time. And it's a lockdown because the groups go back to lockdown for the time that they're not allowed to go to work. You can see automatically that you have reduced the contacts between people by reducing the number of people who are out to work at any particular day. And once they go back home, you maintain lockdown-like conditions. So this is a way of getting people back to work in a limited sense so that everybody manages to actually work, but it's applied asynchronously to the different groups. So you can look at this for a model city and ask what are the effects of this on the periodic synchronous lockdown versus the periodic asynchronous lockdown. And it turns out that the periodic asynchronous lockdown or staggered lockdown is really the best option for people to return to work. And this is something that, that we have communicated to, to people who are thinking about decisions like this. What is the best way to move back to work to take a population? And the, the model very unambiguously suggests that the best way to do it is to stagger the number of people who are going to work. As I said, we put an age structure. And then this is, we look at age dependent fractions of those who will exhibit mild symptoms and those of the fraction of those who are hospitalized who will die as a function of the age bracket that they're in. And you can look at the changes in the hospitalization numbers. And for Tamil Nadu, they seem to be, you see, these are Tamil Nadu numbers here. And given these details about the age distribution across different age groups, you can see that you will have a larger or a smaller number, depending upon whether you include age structuring or you leave out age structuring. So that's an example of how you can actually predict what happens. The changes above and beyond the very simple non-age structured model that come about if you put an age structure. So here is, as I said, we estimated R0 from the data for Maharashtra. And we started it on April 26, moved 22 days onwards, and then we relaxed the lockdown. So if you, locked, if you lift the lockdown on May 17, you can ask what is the trajectory that you expect given the current value of R0 and where the data seems to sit currently. So the data is that little dot over there. That's where we sit currently. And that would be the expected trajectory of the curve of cases as if you were intended to extrapolate it beyond that particular point. So that's the lockdown period, which is given by a calculation that terminates on the 26th of April. It includes data up to that particular point from a time series of the number of infected. And from there, you attempt to extrapolate outward. You, we've also done a similar calculation for Pune, looking at hospital beds and the requirement for seriously, for seriously infected patients under the staggered lockdown case without the staggered lockdown, including variations in compliance. All of these are detailed, but again, this is the utility of the model that if you can predict in a particular area, Hadab Sarmangwa or Bhavani Pet, et cetera, how many, what is the typical use of hospital beds, ICU units, ventilators, et cetera, that you might anticipate that enables local governments to have a better idea of how to plan for that. So let me summarize at this point by saying that there are some basic messages from this work. The main message that I would like you to take back is that testing and quarantining together is really the most significant non-pharmaceutical intervention that you could possibly imagine. Many people have been saying similar things, many of us have said similar things about the fact that we are not testing enough and because of that, we are not able to assess the level of infection within the population. So all of these calculations go towards buttressing that argument that if you can test and quarantine adequately, if you can contact trace, even trace within the asymptomatic population by just expanding the level of testing that you can do. This is a way of actually reining in the progress of the disease very considerably. And it even works if you don't have a ideal, very fast testing up schedule, even if you can test within three months to six months to a year, it's certainly within pockets where the, infect, where the disease is wrapping up rapidly. That's actually a very strong hindrance to the progress of the disease. The second very specific statement that we make is that staggered asynchronous lockdown is a way to open up post lockdown. And so there we'd compare the synchronous lockdown with the, the, the non-staggered with the staggered lockdown. And we find that the staggered lockdown is really the best way to proceed. And if you combine a staggered lockdown with testing and quarantining, that really is the best direction in which you can possibly move post lockdown. 
among, as you saw from the description of the model, among the current epidemiological models for India, this is the most detailed. It has nine compartments. It sticks very closely to what is known about the disease in terms of, of the amount of time that you spend if you're asymptomatic, if you're pre-symptomatic, if you're strongly symptomatic, et cetera, your trajectory through the hospital, through, through um, your trajectory towards the final outcome of either recovering or dying. The main difficulties that all models will face, and we will probably have the discussion when we come to the end, when we discuss uh, during the, the discussion session, is that all models need in inputs of quality. And the main problem now is really having trustworthy data to base an initial condition on. And apart from that, we need better statistical estimates for many of these quantities. We are working with as, as good estimates as we can for beta, but they themselves depend upon data for the line list. They, they need a time series of the number of infected over, over a period spanning two to three weeks. Unless that data is good, and unless that data is trustworthy, and unless we have a little more idea what is a fraction of asymptomatic patients versus symptomatic patients, we really will not be able to proceed much further. So with that, let me just thank a whole bunch of collaborators. So Snehal, Bhajandra, Mehir, Dheeraj, Pinaki, Shatabra, Anupama, and Vishesha are people who sort of are at the core of this particular project. There are many others who have contributed to my understanding. I will not name them. This, just be assured that there are large numbers of them. And this is, of course, ongoing work with this group. And we hope to expand the scope of what this model can do in the future. So let me stop with that. And thank you very much. Thanks, Gautam, for uh, the presentation. So we are way above time. So we have crossed uh, Apologies. 20 minutes. So, uh, yeah, so uh, I'll just take one or two questions. So how many free parameters are there? Because this is, I think, a important question that everybody should uh, respond to. And also, if you can say something, how testing strategies have been incorporated into the model at all, or can be uh, accommodated and so on. Yeah, so the, the, the real parameter is the beta parameter, which feeds into R0. And the assumptions go into determining what the Cs are, because that tells you what is the level at which you can intervene in terms of testing and, and, and uh, quarantining. And the beta is, uh, for all models, either you can call it beta or you can call it R0. It's really the same thing. But that's, that's a central parameter that we use. We have some bounds on it based on data from Italy, China, US, et cetera, et cetera, and even Indian data. And that's what we use. We use the, the time series of the Indian data to get a good example, a good estimate for what that beta is. Um, was, yes. there, was there a second part of that question, Pinaki? Sorry. Yeah, so the, about testing strategies. Do you, how do you uh, incorporate testing strategies into the model? So their uh, testing strategy, the, the efficiency of testing strategies are, in, are put into that, that, the quantity C. So we assume that testing is going to improve and become more broad-based in the future. That implies a certain trajectory for the C, quantity Cs that enter the model. Right now, we assume that it just rises exponentially over some time scale. Whether that actually fits the true testing regime is not very clear. And most likely it doesn't do that. It isn't rising exponentially fast, but it's somewhat slower than that. And the question of, of adequate testing comes in the statistical estimation of quantities like beta. So that's a different question. How do you improve statistics in order to get better values for the beta that influences your R0? OK, so thank you, Gautam, for this nice presentation. So we now move on to the next presentation, which is by Om Damani from IIT Bombay. And, uh, he will be talking about tackling COVID-19, testing, tracing, social distancing, and hygiene. So Om, you can start now. Yes, so let me share my screen. Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, everyone can see my screen? I assume. So yeah. uh, this is a uh, joint work with my colleague, Professor Jendra and Venkateswaran. The two of us have uh, developed it together, practically sitting all the time together uh, for a long period. And of course, with support from Dr. Tarun Patnaga, Dr. Grigar Babu, and a whole bunch of current and graduated uh, students, uh, PhD students whose names are given there. So. The big question for us so first is what is the goal of the model? As soon as I mean we started thinking about this problem that what should we be doing? And really our goal was not what will happen, because what will happen depends on what we do. And so therefore goal was what should we be doing? I mean, this seems such a big crisis. So the purpose is what if by the way, do remind me after 10 minutes and 15 minutes if I forget, 
I'll make sure I stick to the time. Uh, so the so goal is what if scenario analysis to compare intervention, uh, given that there is uncertainty in data. So there is so much debate about what's the real number of asymptomatics out there, or even the symptomatics. We are only test. I mean, all the discussion about testing and everything, everybody knows. So similarly, the model para. So many of the model parameters are still debatable, or may depend on the geographic condition, socio-economic conditions, and so many other things. So our real goal was to compare the relative impacts of interventions and intervention combination, and we believe that even if there is uncertainty in data. But uh, the uh, I mean we can with high confidence know which interventions are more likely to work than others, and the, so that's possible as long as data and the parameter we get the relative values right, not the absolute value. Of course, there were a lot of philosophical issues and conflict we were facing with ourselves with others as we were discussing other. Uh, first, we position to take which models understand, but whether to go for absolute projections at all or not. That is, we we track real life data and then we say, okay, based on this, this is how many infections we'll have, this many, how many deaths, how many hospital beds or death. As we were interacting with uh, some uh, government officials, some other people, we realized that no matter how many disclaimers and qualifiers you put, people need absolute number. They want absolute number. I don't know whether they need, and they will just going to lap it up. So that was one conflict we are facing, whether to how much emphasis to give to absolute number. Other is, of course, the whole issue of lockdown, the socio-economic impact of COVID, non-health, and health impact on non-COVID patients. Like what happens to the TB patients? What happens to the heart stroke patients? And finally, for whom are we modeling? Who is our stakeholder? Which community are we targeting? Does uh, do common toilets, as in Dharavi, figure in our model or not? Personal protective equipment for all essential service provider, or at least for the healthcare workers, uh, do they figure in our model? So I mean, just looking at I mean all the uh, I mean we also do the sort of the standard SIR like model. What's the role of air conditioning? Is there a reason that the developed world and developing world the trajectory will be very different and we can't just take their model? What about public transport? What kind of uh, prediction we should do for Bombay without talking about local trends in Bombay and population density and what is going to happen in Dharavi? We were asking that question before the things started. I'm just saying these are all the questions for most of which we had no answers, and uh, and we were conflicted. We did some of them, we did not do. I mean, pretty much most of them we didn't do, or we did them in ad hoc. Way. Anyway, a lot of uh, things happened based on these issues, these questions. But uh, I mean, should these questions appear or not appear in our model is a big question. So, and therefore, so one is for which community are modeling, for another is who is the audience? Is it your scientific colleagues? Uh, is it the policy makers? Is it the common people? Is it the community that's getting affected that you are trying to model? Are they even in a position? To... So what should one do? Uh, those are the big questions we were struggling with. Anyway, so coming back to modeling, so we follow the system dynamic. What's a methodology called system dynamics that emphasizes capturing real world processes, causal pathways. It says the model behavior it must be generated by the endogenous feedback, not just by external interaction. So. And the entity flows in the model must respect conservation law, lower various resource constraints and various delay. And so all the parameters would have corresponding real world thing. So some of the seminal work in this area have been the world dynamics model in 70s that gave to the that came with the phrase limits to growth and was a big instrumental in the environmental movement. And the current C roads world climate change simulation model are based on this system dynamics philosophy. So, anyway, so what we have is a, is a detailed age, age, age structured model. So there are 16 age group of five years each, and the interaction between each model it is taken as per the age group. And uh, we talk about various disease transmission pathway, expanding significantly from the standard models. And then uh, model was calibrated, but not for projection purpose, but mainly for structural validation purpose. And then, the, and our goal was to model the inter, uh, model the interventions and simulate it. It's a community transmission model, like most SAI model. Though we discussed this is for cluster transmission, but cluster not just in the sense it has been discussed, but like I said, if you think about the issue of home or air conditioning, issue of how long, to, how close two people are when they interact with each other, and all of that, whether there is a ventilation in the house or not, so that or 
in an event like even is a lot of big public events whether it be in uh, i mean whether various uh, religious groups or social groups the transmission have happened. so in that sense a cluster transmission not in the sense discussed so far uh, because that is appearing as is important uh, i mean important mode of transmission okay so here yeah, this is a very picture of very high level model so by the way, sorry can somebody can i get rid of uh, part of my screen itself is probably showing uh, the zoom speakers is a way to get rid of it it hides part of the model but anyways uh, so this guess. is a very high level model i will break it down uh, i mean i will talk about it uh, in more detail so my colleague jendra is also here and i guess he will jump in as and when needed so uh, so first is the digits transmission model so what is the basic digits progression as discussed uh, just now by sumit so we have susceptible that become exposed then become asymptomatic in infective uh, then become infectious symptomatic and after that uh, they may, and yet each of these stages they may be recovering without progressing to the next stage or the disease keeps progressing so then uh, some people may need hospitalization within hospitalization they may need or may need to go to icu and then finally hopefully they recover or some fraction of time that's the very uh, basic disease progression model so on top of now we have modeling the infection rate so if you look at this part this is where the main infection happened uh, so the infection of course and i will talk little more uh, in detail later on but essentially it's a function of infection from all these different compartments so all the infective people are along this different compartment and uh, so we also model the i mean the contact rate and the interaction rate so age group and contact rate between them uh, so these red things are intervention so we can ignore them for the time being uh, so the con so for each age group you see what is its uh, contact rate with various age groups and uh, and how many what fraction of that population may be uh, infected and at what different stages so that sort of sort of gives us the total interaction and then multiplied by the infectivity which itself may be affected by various other factors so that's the key model of uh, uh, i mean that's our model of infection rate so infectivity is probability of an infection upon interaction between an infected person and a susceptible person a uh, contact rate is the average number of persons a person interacts with in a day of course it's really the it should be ideally it should be the average number of interactions and then so given all these compartment so you have to do a global sum over it so for each age group compute infection from each other age group so for example if you focus on one particular age group and you say how many uh people uh, are going to get infection from symptomatic infections so this is in anyway, this is a some formula without going into detail but essentially you ask uh, how many people are there in the target age group what fractions of them are in that symptomatic infections and then contacts per day what is the so you sum over various types of contacts and that's how you, so this is just uh, one interaction between one compartment and one age group and then you sum over all all age groups and all compartments so that gives some that will look something like this but essentially it's a summation over all of this uh, so various uh, so that's the that's the infection uh, modeling and then infectivity like i said how close you are whether you are using the mask or not how much distance are you maintaining all of that will affect the infectivity which is the probability of infection during an interaction so that was the model then the other intervention the most important is quarantining and isolation so that is this part of the model now so earlier i showed you the top of the model uh, which was the disease progression stage uh, so we assume now while you are infected but not hospitalized then uh, so you are let's say you are at home say let's look at the infectious symptomatics and then either as a result of testing you may be isolated or you may quarantine yourself or all your contacts may be quarantined right? because as a result of contact tracing so the key point is that uh, a person a infectious symptomatic person either may be isolated or may get quarantined or it may be awareness impact that i am uh, now coughing and because i am aware about the covid so i may just quarantine myself 
So isolation means I have tested positive. So then maybe I'm in a hospital facility or a very well isolated facility. Whereas quarantine means I may be at home quarantine or institutional quarantine, depending on how I was discovered. But my degree of isolation would be little less than if I was positive. So while quarantining, I am infectious, but I may not know it. While isolated means I know that, uh, I mean, I have tested positive. And as a result of contact tracing, the asymptomatic infectives may also be similar. If the asymptomatic infectives are tested, uh, then they may get isolated or they may quarantine themselves as a result of either awareness effort or a result of contact tracing. So when somebody tested positive, some fraction, I mean, a good fraction of their contacts may be asked to quarantine themselves. And then, of course, disease progression pathway will take place while you are in these uh, compartments also. So that is the roughly the main model. We also model hospital capacity in detail. Here, the main concern that was raised to us a month back was the issue of hospital overflow. So if you see that there's a demand on hospital, so this is a sort of, you can add this to the bottom part of our year disease progression model. Main thing is, okay, so now earlier model will generate certain numbers in each compartment, but hospital now we introduce only finite capacity. So there is an overflow. And of course, uh, this overflow has to be as per the age groups and other things. And then while in the overflow state, I, we may, again, either the we, one may recover or one may become critical. So the parameters are changed slightly so that we assume you are not getting medical care that's needed. Then your likelihood of uh, disease progression to next severe state becomes higher. And similarly, the probability of uh, going needing ICU or ventilation or dying increases. So this is the hospital capacity model. Uh, so as Anyway, so with that, I think a lot of these other details have been explained by the earlier speakers also. So, so within each compartment, other than this age group uh, and contact structure thing, population is homogeneous, well made. Okay, we also have four contact sphere to test various interventions, which is home, work, school, and other. And these interactions are age dependent, like we said, in each of these four contact spheres. And so there are various other interaction but we do not have a mobility model so the all india the interaction is the mobility is assumed to be implicit in uh, this you know? and uh, while calibrating the lockdown we assume that interaction at work reduced by 80 percent and at uh, school by 100 percent and in other zones by 70 percent where people have to go out for essentials and these are some of the parameters that were picked from literature and then slightly calibrated uh, based on just the initial period data so age and zone is the contact metrics were picked from frame at all. And we actually apply a multiplier to it. I will talk about it. Uh, we believe the asymptomatics in the second bucket are going to be trans uh, infecting at half the rate of fully symptomatic for those 48 hour period. And there is a base infectivity. So there are different delays that we have gathered from various literature. And so, okay. So now the main goal of the work is to talk about what should be done, like we said. So as earlier speaker talked about, basic reproduction number R0. Our use of term C is slightly different from earlier speakers. So just please pay attention. So for us, the, so for this disease to die out, of course, the reproduction number should fall below one. C is number of contacts or number of interactions per day between an infected and such a person. It's just the number of interactions. I is the infectivity, the probability of infection in such an interaction. And D is the disease duration for which a person stays infected. So the C and I values were taken for literature and then tuned. But also note that in the model, the product C into I matters. And that's why other models use a single parameter. So anyway, I'll come back to that. So slight uh, value, change in uh, value of C can be compensated by a change in value of I. So, but this does give us, th why, why distinguish between C and I? Because it gives us three different types of intervention. Infectivity. That is the probability of infection during an interaction can be reduced by social distancing right? by maintaining six feet or what as many feet as you can use of mask personal protective equipment if you are essential service provider washing the hands and i mean all the better personal hygiene uh, taking a bath you have come out from crowded place. again how who can afford it and how much can they afford it like i mentioned those are separate questions Whereas reducing C, which is the number of interactions themselves. So this is social interactions at home or outside. 
or reduce level of contact at school or work. And in different sphere, you can reduce it differently. But point is, so I mean, lockdown is of course one group to say, but various for more granular policies for each of these spheres can be designed. And then D, uh, the duration of disease when one is infected, of course, they are, need medical interventions that are outside the scope of our work. But we say that contact tracing, isolation, and quarantining is effectively achieving reducing D. That is the number of days when a person is infecting others. So that sort of says that if we look at this basic equation, this gives us three strategies to reduce C, I, and D, we say, and how to reduce each one of them, and of course, in combination. And then, now this R0 is the basic number. As we intervene, then we want to compute the dynamic RT, the actual reproduction number, and we simply model it as, of course, with this using average over. So infections per day divided by the number of infective from all the compartment, and then we can multiply that by the disease duration to get the running RT. So, so Om, your Om, 15 minutes yes. is up, so five minutes left. Okay, so. So very quickly then, uh, so these are the three, so I won't go into the detail here, but mask use, physical distancing, personal hygiene, contact reduction. Only thing is contact reduction is granular. So our parameter will change value at home, school, work, and uh, differently, we assume, because our goal is to open the economy. So the uh, work is, uh, it's essential to open the work, and that results in certain other interactions. And schools also have to be open. How long can you keep the schools closed? While well, we can reduce more interactions at home and social functions, gathering, or general avoidable interactions. Contact tracing and isolation, again, there's a parameter. It refers to the fraction of patients that can be isolated within 2.5 days of onset of symptom and a corresponding fraction of their point. So key point here is now to show this. Uh, we tune the model, calibrate, and so in this case, we find R0 to be 4.8 based on that earlier calibration of the data. Uh, that is with a certain value of this uh, social distancing and contact tracing and isolation. So that's just the calibration. So you get some value for base case. Now you say I can make each one of the interventions. What if I only promote heavily the mask use, physical distancing, and hygiene, which is an individual can do? Or we do contact reduction, which is like work closure, school closure, or a fraction, whatever is being discussed. Or the other third policy, CTIQ, uh, which is the contact tracing and isolation. And then what you find, then we pick those values of these uh, reduction parameters, so shown on the left, point four, whatever these values, uh, that bring down the R0 from 4.8 to 2.6. So this was just uh, for a uniform comparison. Then we say we can combine two of these inter interventions. So when we combine the first two, we get 1.43, similarly 1.33, and so on. And uh, finally, if we combine all three interventions, then the R0 value comes below 0.92, uh, be comes to 0.92. So below one, that means that the pandemic can be contained. So what, the important point here is, of course, we don't know. We have picked some value 0 0.73, 0 0.44. In practice, what happened? The key message here is that all of these are important. Anyone will not do because, of course, you cannot do it to the 100% uh, percent success. Uh, so all three must be done. They must be uh, done to the extent. And that then a success is possible. It's not all doomed. And, and pandemic can be contained if we aggressively pursue promotion of mask use, physical distancing, hygiene, along with contact reduction and contact tracing and isolation. So since I don't have much time, I will skip uh, the calibration question, and that was not also the focus of our work because that's not the projection, but it was to get the initial estimate uh, for the models. And then, of course, like I said, all the charts are there under various policies, the absolute number of uh, infections and all the parameters, but uh, I would like to leave time for interaction. So there are a number of policies we have simulated, and in addition to those uh, eight that I just discussed, which is the uh, a granular combination of those three, then we can vary parameters for each of those three policies. So there are various combinations. And even a rising graph like this, these are for various states, whatever our model shows, but a rising graph like this, still it reaches an asymptomatic limit. So it's not, uh, it's still the pandemic is in control. It's not, I mean, it's going to give us a very long time, even if because the pandemic can be controlled at a very high level. So what we don't know, in my opinion, but are very important, is this infectivity, modeling infectivity that uh, we also don't know and nobody else talked about. Duration, manner, and intensity of interaction. Just because I come in contact with a COVID-positive patient doesn't mean I will get infected. Right? 
so there is so much literature on it how long they are this how close should you be how much should you be talking the issue of air flow and there the role of air conditioning when we take western world model what's a developing world i think the issue of air conditioning centralized air conditioning will become very important and why it is spread in a uh, the clustered environment and then the dwelling density ventilation issue of common toilets when we talk about dharavi or most of our urban area mumbai ahmedabad uh, the slums because uh, and there are many reports that the infection is spreading from common toilets and, and the house uh, in small house if there are eight ten people so what where should our focus be and these will all determine cluster impacts so i think these are very important things that we we don't do and probably so far others also don't do but something that needs to be done so to conclude we believe that pandemic can be controlled with all the three measures of course with the contact tracing isolation and the quarantining but in, uh, promoting improved hygiene use of face mask of uh, social or physical distancing and ppe for the this we have been raising for months now the personal protective equipment for all essential service provider the critical and then reducing contact at home and non work non school work in school some minor adjustment we assume whereas home and other sphere so that yeah with that i would like to end saying that once we, if we can put all of this the pandemic can be controlled thank you thank you so thank yeah thank you om uh, for the nice presentation so one quick question so i mean this is tech two questions or no so what is the impact of mask use that is evidence to back up the values that you are putting using for mask use impact so for any intervention that you are using what well, how do you input the parameters so that's so uh, we saw in the table and we can say these things right so this is the base case calibrated so this was just to say that look since the lockdown has started people had started using mask people have started doing social distancing there is some awareness so if pre lockdown we assume to be one uh, we sort of calibrated it to 0.8 which means the well, the probability of infection during an interaction reduces to 0.8 if you are maintaining social distancing and some degree of mask in the early days of lockdown now with the more and more awareness and uh, like there are different type of mask we read all the reports and also discuss with doctor they were all saying yeah, these masks usually they say they can reduce by up to 50% or whatever this was home made mask versus surgical mask and all of that sorry i am not sure if i answered your question but uh, so the mask use is a it's a mask use combined mask use distancing and hygiene all three right also the fomite transmission we have like the if you come back home and wash your hand that's not modeled in any of the sir model but we presume it gives you some benefit so all of that the hygiene distancing and mask use together we take as a multiplicative factor okay thank you so there is also question about deterministic models maybe we come back to that question later on when you have a panel discussion among all the speakers so thank you om we'll, because we have uh, really crossed yeah. a lot of time so maybe we go move on to the next speaker uh, so the next speaker is sai vignanampati from iit bombay and he'll be talking about uh, another compartmental model for india centric interventions against covid 19 so sai are you ready Yes, I'm. I'm ready. I'm just waiting on uh, Om to stop sharing so that I can. I think you can just screen. start sharing. Yeah. Okay. okay. Can everyone see? Um... Yeah, we can see your screen. Yes. Okay. Um, still. There we go. Okay. Thank you, um, everyone, uh, for uh, joining us today. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about um, the model that uh, Mithun Mitra, who's in this call right now, and uh, I have developed in uh, uh, in conjunction with a lot of uh, authors who are on the screen. For uh, brevity, I won't mention all of them. I just want to draw your attention to Kem and Vandana, who are actually in the ISRC group, and uh, Aditra Giridhar and uh, Tarun, who are part of the uh, ICMR um, team. Um, so with that, let me just uh, get ahead with uh, what our model is about. Uh, what we wanted to do, the overview of what the model tries to accomplish is the following. Um, so it's a generalized SEIR model, um, just like many of the other talks before us. Um, but it includes testing fraction, age stratification, and it tries to incorporate uh, the states. 
and I'll talk about that as we go along. It explicitly models the lockdown as well. Um, it incorporates uncertainties and heterogeneity in the testing rates from different states. Um, it also incorporates district level modeling. Um, it incorporates a realistic transport data. So this is something I'd like to emphasize. Um, and it incorporates uh, some Bayesian techniques to make predictions with requisite uncertainties. So we hope that when uh, we've uh, converged on this model and when the work is done, that we can open source this code at some point so that it can be uh, peer reviewed thoroughly and it can also be borrowed and extended um, as people choose fit. So that's the overview of what the model tries to do. Uh, the policy questions that we asked ourselves was basically, um, what is the impact of a targeted lockdown? So um, this, you know, we're essentially in the middle of one right now. Uh, what's the relative importance of testing versus lockdown? Because this is, you know, something that was also, I think, of interest to study and then to kind of highlight for people who are interested um, in the policy circles. Uh, the relative importance of distancing versus lockdown and also trying to predict developing hotspots, um, at least qualitatively predict developing hotspots so that um, targeted interventions can be applied to those, uh, uh, those hotspots. So those are what we were uh, going after. So I'll show you some results. So um, let me begin by describing the model. So you've seen uh, many uh, SIR type models um, uh, before. So uh, I hope that the diagram is uh, somewhat self-explanatory. So we have a generalization of an uh, SIR model, but um, what I want to highlight uh, is essentially an important um, uh, term here, which is, uh, which is a compartment here, which is this P compartment, um, sorry which is a P compartment um, in, in the middle. And that's the number of people who've tested positive. So that's something that uh, I want to emphasize because the tested positive is, uh, is a number that we can then compare against the reported data. So um, just like all the other SCIR models, we have a susceptible uh, uh, compartment. We have an asymptomatic A, we have an uh, infected I and an um, asymptomatic, um, uh, uh, we have a pre-symptomatic A and an asymptomatic E. And uh, what we also model, these are in the X compartments, uh, uh, which are given below, uh, are, the, um, are those exact same compartments under lockdown. So um, by switching on or off the lockdown uh, rates, kappa not and mu, what we can do is we can put people, we can transfer people from, let's say, a susceptible compartment uh, to a susceptible compartment that's under lockdown. And then after a certain time, we can release them from, uh, from the lockdown back into the general public. And so likewise with the uh, pre-symptomatic, which is the A compartment, the asymptomatic, which is the E compartment, the infected. The people who test positive, uh, their only route um, in this model is to go to the recovered or the removed compartment R. So that's the basic idea of the model and different rates um, that are involved in the, in the model are also presented here. So um, what we've also done is we've age stratified the model, but we've age stratified it to uh, three age uh, groups. Um, uh, so less than 20, uh, so these are basically children and young adults uh, who are, you know, who are um, going to college. The 20 to 60 basically is the workforce population. It's, a, it's meant to be a proxy for the workforce population an approximation to the workforce population. And so that all of the transport basically happens in this, in this workforce population. Uh, all of the work transport happens in the workforce population. And then over 60s, uh, which are uh, folks who, are, who we are worried about from um, looking at the mortality data and so on and so forth. So the age stratification is implemented in a somewhat simplified manner, but it captures all of the essential details that we would be worried about um, when we are trying to make policy, for instance. Uh, for those who are making policy. So here are the equations. I've, uh, I've exchanged this in a previous uh, um, um, slide uh, set before, so I'll just move on. Um, so the question that uh, um, uh, that uh, was on our minds and perhaps is on your minds is how are testing fractions obtained, right? So where do testing fractions go into our model? So let me back up just one second. There are three rates, uh, kappa prime, uh, a kappa, which is indicated in green, it goes from I to P and XI to P. Kappa prime, uh, which goes from E to P and XE to P. And uh, kappa double prime, which goes from A to P and XA to P. So these three rates are testing rates and these testing rates are basically determined from testing fractions. So um, our model, what it does is it accommodates basically the heterogeneity of different states, so states so this is a known fact that different states are testing at different rates. And so we wanted to put that into our model and study the effect that that has. And so um, kappa t, kappa, uh, kappa t prime and kappa t double prime depend on the testing fractions, which I will get to in a second. 
While I'm on this slide, let me just uh, mention, uh, this was a question that often arises um, uh, uh, that arose in all the other talks. So there are two fitting parameters for our model. So uh, for every unit cell that we construct, so if I want to model states in the country, then uh, each state will get a beta and a beta one, which are both fitting parameters um, times the number of states. If I'm modeling districts in a state, then it's beta, beta one per district times the number of districts. So that should clarify the number of parameters in the problem. Um, beta and beta one um, uh, can actually just be read off from the, uh, from the diagram here. Uh, let me just emphasize that beta one is actually the effect of an imperfect lockdown. So beta tells you the rate at which susceptibles uh, go to um, pre-symptomatic. Uh, whereas um, if we are in a perfect lockdown, of course, then uh, the moment I put you in lockdown, I put the person in lockdown, then uh, they, excess should not be able to travel to XA because there should be no way to infect somebody. But because uh, lockdowns are imperfect, given the kind of um, uh, the duration that this disease um, is pre-symptomatic for, and given the imperfect nature of, uh, of life, um, uh, the beta one parameter essentially models the imperfect lockdown. So um, these are the important parameters. There are others which I'm happy to discuss uh, offline. Um, so now we need to determine what the testing fractions are. And this basically, um, we relied very heavily on Professor uh, Shorendra Gupta, um, Gupta's uh, preprint, which I've cited here. Um, and so uh, I'll just take you, walk you through the argument here. So the case fatality rates, uh, CFRs are determined essentially as the ratio of the number of deaths to the number of deaths plus recovered. And so what you do is from this, you can basically, uh, you can write basically a measurement error rate uh, uh, which is on the screen, which basically models the ratio of the true number of uh, number of recoveries to the reported number of recoveries, and so you can invert this basically um, and write basically uh, this uh, uh, this uh, quantity xi as basically rho times one minus CFR by CFR, where rho is basically obtained from the reported data. So it's the uh, it's a d over r, and it's it's obtained from the reported data. We pegged CFR to the uh, to two point three percent, which is numbers that uh, the World Health Organization released from uh, their study of the Chinese data that was available. Um, and so uh, the testing fraction is, of course, one over this this quantity size. So you know, so from from this, what we can do is we can go to each state and we can look at the D and the R numbers and we can put those um, put those. In. But uh, there's one more thing that we did, which is that we tried to incorporate um, two separate pieces of data, which will inform basically how well testing is happening. One of these is on the left. Uh, it's basically uh, uh, the number of tests per million. Uh, so each alternate state is actually uh, labeled here. And so Delhi, which sticks out, uh, just labeled it uh, separately. And on the right-hand side, uh, you have a different uh, uh, thing, which is basically, it's called uh, the health index. It's a number that is released by the Niti Aayog. So the report is attached, um, uh, is, is referred to for your, uh, uh, you know, for you to look up. Um, and so both of these basically are important factors. Why are they important factors? Because of course the tests per million determine, directly determine the number of people who are going to actually show up as positives in your, um, in your data set. And so that's important in corporate. Uh, but there is another factor, which is this health index. And health index, what it is, is it's a proxy for how well prepared these states are for pandemics. So by looking at other pandemics, basically Niti Aayog has come up with um, uh, with a um, with a number. It's uh, you know like all numbers that are trying to quantify uh, complex uh, phenomena. It's imperfect, but uh, we went with it. Um, uh, and the number basically tries to just inform uh, you as to which the better prepared states are and which the less well prepared states are. So we folded these two numbers in, in, in and um, we arrived at this kind of uh, uh, this method of calculating the testing rate for a state. So what we do is we take the um, uh, the D and the R and we calculate the row and so we just watch for the time series to settle down a little bit and the imperfect nature of the settling down you can see on the graph that are presented for Kerala. Um, and so from that we extract row uh, Kerala, which is, uh, you know, 0 0.06 for this. So you just, you know, you just draw a straight line somewhere and extract this number. And by using that, you can calculate basically what the, uh, what the testing rates are. So why is Kerala singled out here? Because what we uh, basically assumed was that Kerala's data is very reliable. It's the best performing state in terms of healthcare preparedness, in terms of uh, many, many other socioeconomic factors, uh, which, 
which means that if you have to rely on any piece of data from any part of the country, we should first rely on the Kerala data. So what we did was we pegged all the other states testing rates, uh, testing fractions to so actually the Kerala number. So you take the Kerala number, which is the equation on the uh, at the bottom, F Kerala. And then what you do is you take the ratio of the health index of the state to the health index of Kerala. So it essentially tells you how well prepared is the state in comparison to Kerala. And you then take the test per million of the state to the test per million of Kerala. So um, you can pause and ask why uh, was health index separately taken from the test per million. And the reason for this is that some states, even though are somewhat um, in the middle of the, uh, of the ranking order in terms of the health index, have actually stepped up and tested uh, far uh, far more than one would expect them, which is good. And so we wanted to make sure that this uh, that this variability in the governmental response is also indicated um, in our um, in our state testing rate. So that's the way that we calculated the state testing rates. And then there is some simple algebra that connects it to basically the testing uh, the testing fraction f's. Uh, sorry, and then there's some simple algebra that connects it to the testing rates kappa t kappa t prime and kappa t double prime. So um, so that's um, about that, so just to make sure that we were uh, we were doing things sensibly, we tried to directly estimate the uh, uh, testing rate for Kerala, te the testing fraction for Karnataka, and indirectly estimated from our method, and the numbers seem somewhat consistent. So I think uh, if we are off the mark, we're not off the mark by much. Is is the way I would say it. Um, and so that's the technique that we've used to use uh, to compute the testing fraction. Um, the other thing that I want to mention um, is that. Uh, uh, due to our colleagues, uh, thanks to our colleagues, uh, Avijit Maji, uh, uh, Sandeepan Roy, and uh, and B. Sushma uh, at IIT Bombay, we've been able to incorporate basically the uh, district level transport matrices uh, for all of the uh, districts in India, essentially. Uh, so the way this works is basically it uses um, uh, worker population ratios and trip length distributions. Um, and uh, uses GIS uh, uh, maps and so on and so forth to do this, um, and then estimates essentially the number of people traveling uh, as rates going from one district to another. So the district level transportation matrix can be used to construct the state level transportation matrix, and likewise, you can push it out to the country as well. So it allows for simulations which are actually pegged to the actual transport uh, that, is, uh, that is happening, of course, before lockdown, and, um, and allows for the simulation um, and forecasting to happen. So uh, what this allows us to do is basically, given this underlying transportation matrix, we can of course reduce it by some level um, to model basically partial lockdowns and so on and so forth. So that's something I just want to point out as well. And the, uh, one of the final things that I want to mention is uh, how do you discuss basically, um, how, how do you uh, estimate what the trajectory is? So we used uh, some standard techniques that exist um, in estimation theory. Uh, uh, which is what's called a Kalman filter. So it's a predictor character type mechanism or um, a type model or a recursive Bayesian estimator. And so we just use the recursive Bayesian estimator to try and lock onto the correct trajectory. So just as an example, on the lower right-hand side, um, you can see a, a diagram where the true trajectory is basically in the green, the red, and the blue. Um, it doesn't matter what the compartments are. And then the green, uh, uh, thick green shadow is actually an uncertainty region that's given, and then it locks onto the correct trajectory given the, uh, given the data. So that's uh, that's the thing that we've used. Um, and uh, before um, uh, I get carried away and try to make uh, uh, any kind of uh, statements about numbers being taken too seriously, I put a warning for myself, which is that there are lots of assumptions, simplifications, and limitations of model. So um, it's the, there's the typical compartmental model problem. There is various parameters that have to be uh, that were taken as median values as opposed to the distribution. Mortality is estimated essentially pegged to some date. So the uh, nonlinear Kalman filter that we use, the extended Kalman filter is not a blue, which is a technical point which I'm happy to take up, so on and so forth. So, uh, you know, so we should take the results that I'm going to present to you only as qualitative statements and not quantitative statements. So with that, let me uh, just talk about the interventions that I'm going to present to you today. So the interventions are three uh, interventions that I want to present to you. The first is just the baseline scenario, lockdown till May 3rd, nothing afterwards. The second is uh, intervention number one, which is basically uh, uh, health index pegged uh, uh, testing. So this is some this is something where the lockdown ends on May 3rd and then no colleges till the end of June uh, rank states according to three partitions uh, of their health index. So Kerala is on top. 
Um, and then what you what we do is basically the top move to Kerala's testing rate. So it's not um, it's unusual, but it is not unrealistic because Kerala in the country is already testing at that rate. Uh, and uh, the middle move to 50% of Kerala, bottom 25% of Kerala. Uh, and the last intervention that we wanted to check was a very heavy intervention, a heavy handed uh, heterogeneous intervention. So this is where the entire country uh, lockdown is till May 3rd, and then no colleges till the end of June. Reduce all contact matrices to 50%. So this basically models uh, some sort of reduced contact uh, uh, with which work can be allowed. So this, you know, you can interpret it whichever way you want. Um, transport matrices are reduced to 50%. So essentially all the non-essential workforce is asked to stay at home or an office work is somehow managed by a reduced workforce. Lockdown, um, uh, lockdown a state or a, or a unit cell, a district or a state, if the number of positives divided by the total number uh, of the population of the state crosses 0.01%. So this is a very harsh lockdown, basically. So this is a vigilant government that's looking for positives. And the moment there are positives, it locks everything down. Um, I want to note that this is not a government that is testing at unrealistic rates. These are still testing at the same underlying rates. So with this, let me just quickly conclude by showing you a couple of uh, results. So, as you, uh, so what I've presented are three states, uh, three interventions for Kerala. So the no intervention uh, is on the upper left-hand side, uh, then intervention one and intervention two. The only qualitative thing that I want you to take away from this is that um, so the percentage of the population goes from 6% if no interventions, 3.5% if the intervention one is, uh, is uh, imposed, and 0.001% uh, if the intervention two is imposed. And uh, the uncertainty curves that you see come from the estimators that we used. Uh, West Bengal, on the other hand, basically 60% of no intervention, 35 if there is intervention, and uh, somewhere between 40 and 45 if uh, if intervention 2 is, uh, is imposed. The region that is shaded in pink is where the uh, heterogeneous lockdown is imposed on West Bengal, basically. So the simulation is run for the whole country, and this is just the West Bengal result, I'm showing sure. you. Um, here is a state which is basically somewhere in the middle. So Gujarat, 40-45% uh, if nothing is done. Um, this is the um, uh, this is the infected is in the green, um, uh, roughly twenty five percent if uh, intervention one is imposed and 0.02 percent if intervention two is imposed. Um, so likewise, what we did was uh, we took um, uh, our model, as I've said, can be also deployed for a state and its district. So uh, we took the district level simulation for Karnataka, and so uh, sorry, even though the graph uh, the diagram is for Maharashtra. Um, so here is Bangalore, and you can see basically this was just no intervention. So this was just an uh, an analysis just to see if we have the if we have the numbers are even making any sense. And the numbers. Um, so this is an older simulation. So is, the data is only till like 18, 19 April. Uh, but when we looked up the uh, compared our numbers against the against the current numbers, they are they are somewhat sensible. They're still sensible. So the simulation is not uh, is not uh, completely out of uh, character in terms of predicting. Um, uh, here is Mysore. Uh, you know, as you can see, the number of positives tested are in the uh, the reported data from India COVID nineteen is in the red. Uh, the blue is our models positives, and the green is our models infected. And you know, would it be for you know for what it's worth, you can just look. And so the the entire all of the districts are simulated. Uh, uh, this way for Karnataka. So let me conclude very quickly. So increased national testing and quarantine, like many others have, uh, have said before me, um, offer some of the best strategies for us to combat the spread. Heterogeneous lockdown with, uh, with these aforementioned strategies plus physical distancing, which is modeled as a reduction in the contact rates, is very effective. States with good testing and health infrastructures control the epidemic effectively um, in the lockdown period. Post-lockdown, uh, migration from underperforming states uh, can negatively impact the health outcomes of the states which uh, have good testing rates. So we've seen that in our simulations as well. So this um, this was uh, something that uh, I think is a conclusion that um, is quite intriguing to the other things. Uh, I just want to mention there are many, many assumptions that I've already outlined. So um, uh, we are trying right now to fine tune the variances of the estimators to make things better. We're trying to basically take on uh, district-wide simulations for the whole nation. So that's a little bit um, of a complicated run, um, and we're trying to generalize uh, the median parameters, which we've just pegged to, um, to realistic probability distributions, among other things. So thank you very much, and I'll take questions. Thanks, Sai, for the nice presentation.
So one question that has come up is about the use of the Kalman filter. So it's, uh, yes. it's a question from Prashant Kumar. So he says that the implementation of the filter needs error in model, initial state and observations. How do you calculate these values? Yeah, so we just peg them to uh, uh, Gaussian errors because otherwise you're in real trouble. So this is a fair point. So let me just explain what we wanted out of the, uh, out, what, what we wanted to do with the Kalman filter. What we wanted to do was something that Professor Menon mentioned in his talk, which is that the initial conditions of any deterministic model are not particularly well known. And so uh, this is a problem that uh, that already exists in, in various other branches where you're trying to try to shoot down a flying plane, for instance. And so the, these estimators essentially just uh, manage that uncertainty. So what we did was we put, uh, we first of all assume Gaussian probability distributions for which the results are somewhat nice. Um, and then, um, uh, so it's an unrealistic assumption uh, if you if you if you want to challenge me on that. Even though for large numbers maybe it's okay. Um, and uh, uh, what we did was we took the uncertainty region large enough so that uh, so that the results um, were somewhat trustworthy. What do I mean by this? So if I go back to March first and I want to say that there was one person infected in the country, I give it basically plus minus 15, 20 people so that, you know, that's a more realistic assumption than just saying one, one person's affected. So, uh, so that's, the, that's the way in which we like the, uh, the Kalman uh, filter better. Okay, so thanks, Sai. Thanks for the nice presentation. We have to stop here because we are running 20 minutes behind time. So we have to- Thank you very much. Time. Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much. Yeah. So next speaker is uh, Girish Setlur. Girish, are you ready? So Girish will be talking about modeling and simulation of COVID-19 propagation in a large population with specific reference to India. Good afternoon. I'm Girish Sajur, professor at the Department of Physics in IIT Gahati. I thank the organizers. Can you speak a bit ISS louder, Girish? for inviting us to represent IIT Gahati. ISRC stands for Indian Scientists Response to COVID-19. We at IIT Gahati of ISRC to provide rational, timely, and accurate information about COVID-19 that is easily understood by the public at large. The importance of this effort in combating fake information rooted in superstition and other unacceptable belief systems cannot be overstated. I represent the team that comprises three extremely hardworking and bright BTEC engineering physics students. Commendable efforts to learn the basics of this subject on their own and also design and solve compartmental models with features that are quite new indeed. They are Ashish Menon, Nitin Rajendran, and Anish Chandrachur. Those who are new to the field of mathematical epidemiology in particular and mathematical biology in general may be amused and somewhat skeptical to see the complicated mathematical equations describing living systems. While the relevance of a mathematical approach to epidemiology should not be overstated given the large number of simplifying assumptions it entails, it is remarkable that simple, well-motivated mathematical concepts known as compartmental variables and rate equations involving these quantities are quite successful in reproducing a number of salient features of epidemics. Terms such as herd immunity, carrier population, etc., that are now heard in news briefings when earlier they were confined to scholarly conferences or in these. So in this slide, I'm going to tell you the questions that we addressed in this work that we have posted on MedArchive. So one, the first question that we addressed was, why is it necessary to mathematically model this pandemic? The second one 
because how would COVID-19 affect India once the lockdown ends? So the third important point, which one in India? Then what are the policies and decisions, for example, with the epidemic? And this is very important because we don't don't want questions to what extent yeah. and lastly the question was how does migration affect the pandemic in other words uh, migration across different states so that's the one thing we have considered Okay, so in this slide, I describe the relevance of our work to, uh, in general, to society and to the uh, academic literature of epidemiology. So, you see, to society, it's very relevant because uh, we can see through our various uh, sources, COVID patients affected by this ailment uh, worldwide with nearly 2.6 lakhs deaths due to COVID-19. And in it, there are already up 1,700 deaths and counting. So our work uh, is uh, significant on because uh, we are able to study in detail various aspects such as the nature of the pandemic in India before and after lockdown and it uh, generally speaking underscores the importance uh, of investing in basic health infrastructure so as uh, we'll explain the importance of Describing the mathematical model of COVID-19 epidemic and is to introduce what are known as compartmental mathematical models for logical systems. The salient features of these models include the populations involved uh, are assumed to be divided into compartments. So in other words, the affected population, the population affected by the epidemic is assumed to be uh, divided into compartments. And uh, so to give you an example, the compartment could be susceptible individuals, infected individuals or individuals that have recovered from uh, after contracting the disease. So this is the simplest uh, uh, compartments a compartmentalization you can think of and that's the so-called SIR model which is one of the oldest models uh, dating back to the late 20s. So um, the rate of transfer between the compartments are modeled as time derivative of the compartment uh, population sizes and the coefficients of uh, the, the coefficients that appear in these equations have to be uh, they are not uh, you know derivable from the theory or the uh, from these phenomenological models they have to be obtained by fitting actual observational data so the epidemic as is modeled as a set of differential equations and uh, of course uh, if this is not physics so we'll have to make a large number of simplifying assumptions and uh, and uh, most of these assumptions have to be tested on the field and they cannot themselves be derived in any way. Okay, so let's get on with the uh, basic point I was trying 
trying to talk about, namely the in our case, how have we modeled uh, COVID-19, uh, 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 to be specific to India. So the way we have modeled COVID-19 that's specific to India is by in, uh, introducing the following compartments. So the first compartment we uh, discuss is uh, the uh, susceptible individuals, individuals that are susceptible to COVID-19 infection. Then the second compartment is the uh, number of individuals exposed, uh, but they themselves are not infected yet. And IS corresponds to the infected individuals who show symptoms, the symptomatic infected individuals. Then there is the other fourth compartment, which is IAS, which is the infected individuals who do not show symptoms. So they're asymptomatic. So you can see that there are large number of compartments uh, that one has to deal with if you want to make your uh, model realistic. So the fifth compartment is infected individuals who are now in quarantine, but then we uh, decided um, that uh, it would be better to, to dis distinguish between two types of quarantined individuals, one who have just entered quarantine and the other group is uh, individuals who are severely infected and who have entered quarantine. So you might be wondering why there is such a subtle distinction. You'll see later on when we discuss our flow chart that uh, these compartment actually, these two compartments flow into different uh, uh, daughter compartments. So, uh, so the seventh compartment that we had uh, introduced is what is known as uh, the carrier compartment. So these carrier compartments are in infected individuals who were wrongly diagnosed as having recovered by the hospitals and uh, uh, discharged. So uh, that is important because these types of individuals could actually go and uh, uh, again uh, make the pandemic uh, worse. So then the eighth compartment is the number of uh, recovered individuals but who are permanently disabled and are likely not very mobile and their ability to uh, you know get even if they do get reinfected the chances that they'll go around spreading disease would be limited because they're quite disabled by that so then the ninth compartment would be uh, individuals who have recovered but uh, are not uh, disabled so as a result, if they do get reinfected, they could actually spread the disease. And lastly, of course, and sadly, individuals who have actually succumbed to the disease. Okay, uh, so let me describe to you this uh, flow chart uh, that uh, basically pictorially explains the nature of, you see there are various compartments Departments here that are listed S, E, S corresponds to susceptible, E corresponds to exposed. So if you follow the arrow, it tells you what's going on. So for example, the uh, susceptible compartment S, uh, could, some of them could get uh, exposed to the virus and so they become, uh, so the susceptible individuals can get ex exposed. So then the exposed individuals can either become symptomatically infected, which is the compartment IS. So there's an arrow that connects E to IS and uh, E to the exposed individuals can either become symptomatically infected or asymptomatically infected. So, uh, so like that, you'll see that there are lots of arrows and lots of compartments and they'll tell you how all these uh, compartments are connected in our equations. So uh, these are the equations, uh, the compartmental equations that we have to solve. So you see that ds by dt rep represents the rate of increase of the number of susceptible individuals and d by uh, dt of e represents the rate of increase of exposed individuals and so on. So uh, these rates will involve uh, various other compartments and certain constants called alpha and mu. So these alpha, mu and so on, these constants have to be fitted by uh, comparing with actual uh, data in the field. And then once these uh, numbers are fixed, then you, it, this, these equations acquire predictive power and they tell you what will happen uh, much later 
after the initial conditions uh, have been used to fix these constants. Okay, so in this slide, I'm going to describe the effect of lockdown. So there are three types of lockdown. One is called the continuous lockdown, which involves uh, locking down without a break. And there's a periodic lockdown, which involves uh, relaxing the lockdown after, after a couple of days. So for example, you can lock down for seven days, then relax for five, and again lock down for seven days and so on. And the third type of lockdown is called the light switch lockdown which involves locking down when the number of cases crosses a threshold value. So we'll see that this light switch lockdown is quite effective in uh, mitigating the peak or the reducing the peak of this disease. So in this slide, uh, I described the um, effect of periodic lockdown. So the first plot, the blue plot, tells you uh, what happens if you uh, seven days and relax for five days and then again lock down seven days indefinitely. So what will happen is basically it buys you time. So the peak, the peak of the epidemic uh, shifts towards a later time when it gives you time to, uh, you know, uh, ramp up your medical infrastructure. So the really effective type of lockdown is what's called a light switch lockdown, which involves locking down when the number of uh, infected cases uh, crosses a certain threshold. So, so if if you lower the threshold, you will see that uh, able to uh, quickly bring down the peak, as you can see in the second plot. So in these plots, we see uh, the real importance of uh, quarantining and testing asymptomatic individuals. So in the top left uh, plot, you see that if you don't test at all, the peak is very high. But then, uh, so that corresponds to that tau q parameter being infinity. So then if you test, uh, so the moment you decide to test, you will see that uh, you are doing uh, yourself an enormous service because the peak comes down dramatically. So even uh, when the TQ is as high as 600, so the peak has already dropped considerably. So this tells you that uh, uh, you know testing plays a very important role in mitigating this epidemic. So the so that's true for various other types of uh, testing and quarantining procedures that these plots describe. So, so they all have a share a similar feature. So if you don't test, the peak is very high. 
uh, but if you test the peak, it dramatically drops and so on. So in this table, we describe the uh, values of the constants that we use. So remember that in, in our uh, compartmental equation, there are a whole bunch of constants so whose values had to be fixed by compare with, comparing with observations. So this is what uh, done. most of the, uh, our obtain from, we had to adjust them uh, so that uh, you know, the results of our compartmental models uh, matched with the initial observations in the field. So in this plot, you see the comparison between the actual data we obtained uh, from, uh, this, for example, the Worldometer website and the results of our model. So we, we adjusted those constants in that table until we were able to reach a uh, sufficiently good agreement. So. So once this agreement is seen, say from March 12th up to April 23rd, so this model uh, has some sort of predictive power. So it will tell you what will happen, uh, say several months down the, down the line. So that's the reason why this uh, activity is important. Modeling is important because it has predictive power uh, over a time scale of say months. Okay. Um, Concluding remarks, what are the inferences that we could draw based upon our efforts? So the first one is the lifting of lockdown could have serious repercussions in terms of the size of the infected population and the number of deaths. So that it could uh, be in the tens of crores if uh, you lift the lockdown without widespread testing and quarantining individuals. So, so I told you that lockdown simply buys you time. So just uh, locking down is not going to kill the disease. So even locking down for a year would not be enough. And lockdown, so if you lock down around two years, then of course the disease will die on its own, but um, at an enormous social cost. Uh, of deaths. So, of course, the deaths would be in the tens of crores if you don't lock down. But if you lock down for a full two years, you still have a huge number of deaths. So, in both these cases, I'm assuming that we, uh, we completely forego testing and or nearly forego testing and quarantine. So, if you forego testing and quarantining, you either lock down for a full two years and suffer 30, 39 or 40 lakhs of dead people or you do something even worse, which is you just let everybody be as they were normally, and then you suffer a death of around 15 crores. Um, so that's the whole point. So then uh, you really have to test and isolate infected individuals before you lift lockdown. Okay, so the time has come to wind up. So I thank uh, all of you for listening. And uh, we especially, our uh, our team of Ashish Menon, Nitin Rajendran, Anish Chandrachud, uh, thank all the organizers and everyone involved. We hope uh, to beat this pandemic and thank you. Thanks, Girish. Uh... Maybe in the interest of time, we move on uh, to okay. the next talk because uh, we are running out of time. So I suggest okay. that we have back-to-back uh, -back, uh, uh, talks by Rajesh Sundarasan and Harshal Hatnagarkar. After that, we'll get back to questions. So Rajesh, if you are ready, we can start. Yes, I'm ready. So, can Rajesh, you hear me? So we now move to a new class of... Yeah, we can hear you. We now move to a new class of models, these agent-based models, and Rajesh will be talking about unlocking the lockdown in India. So Rajesh, you start. Uh, thank you, Girish. Uh, are you able to see my screen? Yeah. Okay. So uh, my name is Rajesh Sundaresan. I'm from the Indian Institute of Science. And this uh, particular work is joint work with TIFR with technical support from SAP. So I'll quickly begin with some acknowledgements. Uh, so this is my team from IASC, uh, 
Nidin, Nihesh, Pritam, Sharat, Sharat, Narendra, and Aditya Krishna Swami from TFR, Sandeep, Ramprasad, Piyush, Prahlad, Subhadha Agarwal, Siddharth, Anirban, and Anand. And uh, we've been closely working with the Karnataka State Disaster Management Authority, Manoj Rajan and his team, SAP Rahul Lode, and many colleagues from various institutes. So here's a quick introduction. Uh, so the lockdown has been upon us since 25th March 2020. Uh, must emerge out of this. And we need tools to evaluate strategies, various strategies of emergence. We also need tools to evaluate, uh, to adapt to circumstances. So we have come up with two tools. Uh, these are different categories of tools from the ones that you have seen, which involve SEIR modeling. This one is a, is an agent-based city scale uh, simulator. We have made it open source. Uh, we, I'll also do a quick demo of it, or at least show some snapshots. Uh, you can go to this web page, cni.iac.ac.in slash simulator, and you should be able to play with it yourself. We also have a workplace readiness calculator as a means to adapt to circumstances and to enable city administrators to make various decisions. Uh, this too can be experimented with uh, the same site with workplace dash readiness. Uh, from the outset, we were very clear uh, that uh, uh, we want this to be a tool to be used by city and state administrators. Our interest was uh, not to write papers on this. We wanted tools uh, to come up with tools that uh, these people could use to evaluate unlocked on strategies. So we have already conducted various studies, uh, various phased emergences uh, that's uh, reported in our uh, report of 19th April. Just Google search for unlocking the lockdown in India, comma IAC, comma TIFR, and you should be able to get to this report. We have also done another report on the importance of compliance. Uh, we have done uh, one more on the impact of train services in, Bom in uh, Mumbai. Uh, these are things that we are writing up at this moment. Also, there is another study related to what type of containment zones are most effective, ward-wise or 100-meter radius zone-wise containment. Uh, this is also something which is forthcoming. And a workplace readiness reporting and a strategy for opening up core offices. So I'll say a few words about this at the end. So what is our uh, simulator? It's actually an agent-based simulator. We have taken two cities as example cities. Uh, one is uh, Bengaluru with 198 wards. And another one is Mumbai with 24 wards. Both have 1.23 or 1.24 floor agents. The map that you see has uh, uh, the population density color coded. So what we do is uh, we basically uh, get uh, population information, census data, and geographic information, uh, neighborhood wards, and things like that. What are the wards? What are the ward boundaries, et cetera? And then we curate this data and come up with, uh, uh, with a map that essentially tells us where are the individuals uh, how are they associated with other individuals and so on and come to that in a minute and then what we do is create a synthetic city out of this once the city is created we basically look to the biology of this particular disease get parameters related to the uh, uh, evolution within a particular individual and then uh, seed the city with infections and see how the uh, infection spreads now uh, the city that we built has various networks uh, individuals and networks there is the home network there is the, uh, so uh, there is the home network that you see here. I hope you can see my pointer. There's a school network, school, uh, people of school going age go to schools. There are grocery shoppings and other such things, which is the community network. You might go to work, that's factory. You might go to a hospital, you might go to offices. And uh, uh, these are all interaction spaces. And we basically uh, build a social contact network based on these. We also have a transportation network. And then once we build this, once infection is seeded, uh, let's say a particular person is infected, this person belongs to this uh, location, which is a uh, public place. Uh, and she might uh, uh, spread this disease to another person. That person goes to, let's say, his home, uh, his office. He might spread it to somebody in his office. And that person may go to uh, her home and spread it to somebody in the home. So it's really a bunch of interacting networks and we model all of this and we are faithful to the city. So how is this different from the SEIR models? The interactions are based on home network, school network, office network, community space network, transport space network. Uh, so it's not a homogeneous network as is usually the case in SEIR models. In compartmental, compartmentalized SEIR models, these are relaxed to some extent. But here, uh, we basically take the actual network into account. It also takes into account in building these networks, the demographic and the uh, transportation related details of the city. 
Why do we do this? It enables targeted study of interventions, phased opening of some industries, transport, etc. And I'll describe some study outcomes. So how uh, faithful is our city uh, to the true city? So in blue, you will actually see the uh, uh, data from the city. And in red, uh, you will see uh, what our synthetic city has. Um, so if I may request uh, others to mute their microphones, that would help. Um, ah, so uh, uh, are you able to hear me? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear, Rajesh. Thank you, Jasit. Yeah. So uh, the, uh, um, uh, the blue one is essentially from the uh, city uh, parameters, census data, and so on. The first one is basically age distribution. And we, uh, we match, when we instantiate individuals, we try to match this. The next one is household size. We match that as well. Uh, uh, how many households are there with uh, just uh, one person, how many with two, and so on. This one is a workplace size distribution. We try to match that. And you can see that uh, towards the end, uh, our matching is a little off. Uh, those are the large, th those are the very large uh, ones. Uh, and here you would see commute uh, distances. So the blue one is our model, uh, which is taken from the city data uh, from our transportation department gave this information to us. Uh, what wise uh, origin destination matrices. And that from that we came up with this model and made our uh, uh, simulator match this. And the last one here is the school size uh, distribution. So uh, our synthetic city basically has this level of uh, fidelity with the actual data. Once we have this, we can essentially uh, encode one more set of things, which is the infection progression within an individual. Uh, I'll not spend too much time on this, but once an individual is exposed, he or she passes through this incubation period and uh, a pre-symptomatic or an asymptomatic period, symptomatic period. And then if the individual doesn't recover, there are other stages, hospitalization, critical uh, disease, and so on. So we, uh, we study several uh, uh, symptomatic fractions, uh, 0.6, for example, or in this case, it is 0.33. So we, uh, our studies involve uh, various parameterizations. Now I'll give some outputs from our mini city simulator. And the mini city simulator has uh, uh, these parameters that you can input. Uh, so you can choose which city you want, Bangalore or uh, Mumbai, if you go to that website. And then you can also uh, provide various uh, uh, parameters. Uh, uh, these are the uh, disease progression parameters and the transmission coefficients. After this come the uh, various interventions that we have programmed. Some of these are essentially hard coded, uh, but our uh, full scale simulator is uh, uh, more amenable to uh, uh, to uh, other kinds of interventions. Here, you can try only the ones that are given here. Once you do this, you can essentially launch the simulation. Uh, this is for a smaller scale city of one lakh. And uh, you'll see the number symptomatic, number infectious, and so on. And you, you can also track where the infections uh, came from, and so on. So this is uh, <coughs> the outcome when you have uh, no uh, intervention. Uh, this is sort of the outcome that uh, happens when you have an intervention, which is a lockdown. And this lockdown goes on for uh, a long period of time. Uh, so you will see that in this particular small mini city, uh, the infection has capped at 6,000 for our model, whereas uh, without intervention, it's much larger. Now, uh, you can also try out something here, which is 40 days of lockdown followed by 30 days of home quarantine, etc. There are many uh, things that are here. If you choose this, you can see that uh, lockdown has had, had its effect. And then there is 30 days of home quarantine, which basically, uh, uh, so the initial phase is actually no intervention for about 25 days. The simulation begins on March 1st. Then lockdown kicks in and then brings things down. But then once uh, you uh, uh, ease the lockdown, there's 30 days of only home quarantine, uh, school college closures and other things, then things start to go up, but somewhat slowly. And then after that, you essentially see things picking up again. So one can see these uh, kinds of behavior in the simulator that this is largely for educational purposes for people to play with these interventions and understand the importance of compliance and so on so for example you can change the compliance factor here which is essentially how many households comply with the particular uh, directive that has come or the particular intervention and uh, you will see the outcome change as a consequence of very compliance probabilities now uh, there are many parameters uh, much of it is actually related to matching to the city and this is all city census data, household distribution, etc. There are many disease parameters which are based on papers that we have looked at. 
and uh, we try out various parameters. We try out various parameters. Uh, the other thing uh, which we use uh, in our, uh, which we tune or calibrate are these contact rates. And uh, there is a home contact rate, school contact rate, office contact rate, and so on. There's also a seed number and a seed date. These are the only parameters that we tune. All others are essentially just taken from the city, uh, city uh, data. Of course, uh, there are many other things here, uh, which uh, uh, um, so for matching to the marginal distributions, you can have uh, uh, certain uh, parameters put in there. Uh, so those we are choosing in a somewhat judicious way. And uh, we calibrate, uh, we choose these parameters by calibrating to the time series of the first 200 deaths in India, assuming that all of them happen in this particular city. And then we let uh, our uh, uh, city scale simulator run on our uh, city. So uh, I'm now going to describe the output of various uh, studies that we have done. Um, so maybe two or three, depending on how much time I have. So this first study uh, is something which we have highlighted in our report of 19th of April. At that time, the lockdown date was potentially 26 days. And then we, evaluate a phased, we evaluated a phased emergence out of this. And uh, we, uh, uh, the phased emergences involved uh, various kinds of um, uh, uh, emergence. Uh, for example, this one just uh, comes out with only case isolation. Uh, lockdown uh, restrictions end uh, uh, with case isolation and home quarantining are active, but then um, uh, once the uh, lockdown, once after 20th of April, uh, pretty much other things are inactive. Uh, there is then school closures. And then here we uh, studied an odd even kind of strategy where 50% of the uh, office going people could go to work. We'll elaborate, I'll come back to elaborating many of these things. So this is just to highlight the kind of uh, outcomes that uh, we have. So for example, on Mumbai, we tuned uh, our uh, parameter tuning was only to the India deaths up to April 10th, but then we were able to see, uh, and that too in the no intervention uh, scenario, but we were able to see this bend, or we were able to predict this bend at that time. And we see that uh, our simulator is essentially capable of uh, predicting the fatalities uh, reasonably well. So we were very happy because uh, to, to capture this, because this is something that we had not uh, put in our simulator. Uh, but uh, somehow we were able to uh, uh, um, match uh, to this. Uh, this is the number of hospital beds uh, that we are able to predict based on our disease uh, progression. I'll not spend too much time on this. So that's the outcome. We did this out uh, study for both uh, Bangalore and for uh, Mumbai. I presented here only the Mumbai uh, uh, results and that too for an asymptomatic fraction of 0.33. We have a similar outcome for an asymptomatic fraction for of 0 0.66, 0 0.6 as well. Our second study involved uh, highlight uh, was a study to highlight the importance of compliance. So let me elaborate on this a little. So the Ministry of Home Affairs order of uh, 15th of April uh, said that many restrictions will continue until the 3rd of May, but a few activities may be permitted from the 20th of May up to 3rd of May. And these were let, left to the uh, local uh, state, local uh, city and state administrations. For example, uh, the city and state administrations could enable IT and IT enabled uh, services, uh, but they could operate at 50% strength during this period between 20th April and 3rd May. Government of India and state and union territory offices could function at 33% attendance, but there are some critical offices which could operate at full strength. Manufacturing and other industrial establishments with access control in SEZs, for example, they could operate uh, provided that is, they follow some standard operating procedures. So what is the impact of opening up of each of these things? So this is something that is difficult to study using an SEAR model unless you bring in these compartments. Uh, it is rather natural to study these in our agent-based model. And we have, uh, we have done that. Another study, another parameter that we brought in is that uh, uh, compliance may be an important factor. There isn't sufficient data to assess precisely the degree of compliance to the government orders. But Google data, for example, suggests uh, these kinds of movements, uh, movement reductions. Uh, there is some compliance, but it's uh, only to some degree. So we explored two compliance scenarios, 70% uh, of the households comply and 90% of the households comply. And I want to share uh, a comparison of uh, these two with um, opening up of some offices. 
So uh, how do we open up the offices? Uh, we thought of these phased emergencies. So no intervention from the 1st to 13th March. In Bengaluru, as well as in Mumbai, there was some, there was some sort of a pre-lockdown between 14th or 16th, depending on whether it was Bengaluru or Mumbai, until the 24th. And then from the 25th onwards, uh, 25th March onwards, there was the national lockdown. That lockdown went on until 23rd. And then there could be some openings uh, that were possible based on the um, uh, state authorities' uh, 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 decisions. And in, in Bangalore, some offices were actually open. Now, we studied various attendances. For example, you'll see that Government of India and Government of Karnataka offices in Bangalore could operate during this period at 33% and then 100-100. Or alternatively, it could operate at 50% or, uh, sorry, this is IT and IT enabled services. They could operate at 50% or not at all. And then 50% during this period between 4th and 31st May, and then uh, between 1st and 4th July at 100% and so on. Schools and colleges were closed. They could possibly open on the 1st of June. So we, we evaluated these scenarios and there are some definitions here. Let me quickly go to the outcomes. So this is just to indicate that in Bangalore, the compliant, this is the fatal uh, number of hospitalized cases. Uh, this is our uh, lockdown 70% prediction. This is our lockdown 90% compliance prediction. So we seem to be closer to the 70% in Bangalore. And this is what we have with workplace control. So you could open all the three or close all the three. Uh, by all the three, I mean these three, Government of India, Government of Karnataka, IT and IT enabled services and SEZs. Uh, you could open, you could keep all of them closed or all of them open, they would be here with 90% compliance, but with 70% compliance, they would be here. What this suggests is that perhaps you could open up and ensure compliance and things may be at a better level than operating at 70% compliance with lockdown fatigue. So that's uh, one takeaway from this particular study. Uh, so here are the same uh, uh, estimates, but in linear scale. So this is a 70% uh, uh, compliance and this is the 90% compliance. 90% with uh, uh, with, with opening of workplaces may actually be better than uh, lockdown with 70% compliance. The, the figure on the right is uh, the same uh, fatalities in uh, log scale. Uh, I would now like to uh, point out one more, uh, another study, which is essentially the city scale uh, uh, simulation study for Mumbai uh, to understand the effect of trains as well as phased emergence. Uh, so I'll be very quick on this because I want to spend a couple of minutes on one other uh, new study. So uh, here, what we modeled is uh, after, uh, let's say, a certain date, we are going to have case isolation, home quarantine, testing, et cetera. But masks became uh, more prevalent starting from April 9th onwards, face masks. And then uh, we wanted to study uh, containment zone, uh, soft containment zones. And that is uh, something that I will uh, uh, show the outcome of uh, various kinds of uh, containments. And then uh, we also said that 60-year-olds and beyond uh, should practice social distancing. Now, the uh, containment strategy was that the ward is completely open when the number of hospitalized cases in that ward is zero. Uh, when, it, when it comes to about 0.1% of the ward population, the number of hospitalized cases, uh, we close the ward to about 0.1% uh, uh, of, so there's a leakage of about 10%. So this is to model essential uh, uh, services being provided to that particular ward, which has been cordoned off. And in between, we basically go in a linear way. And this is something that we can easily tune in our simulator. The amount of ward closure is proportional in between to the number of hospitalized cases. And this is what we see. Uh, so we also looked at similar phased emergences out of the lockdown, and we saw the following. So for, for example, uh, there are solid curves and dashed curves here. The solid curves correspond to trains being off and the dashed curves correspond to trains being on. Focus on the red curve. So this is when the trains are off, and this is when the trains are on. And the red curve is when you have opening up of all the industries uh, that I had mentioned in the previous slide. Now, when that happens uh, with trains off, this is what uh, you see. This is the number of uh, simulated hospital beds that we will need. Uh, on the other hand, if you uh, um, uh, have the trains on, uh, the spread increases. So uh, there is a model that we have for uh, what kind of interactions happen in the train, and we have a logic for this that we will uh, um, uh, that we'll put up soon. But then uh, this is the kind of prediction that uh, we have. So uh, one can also see, uh, for example, the doubling time, how uh, it actually increases with the lockdown. But then when you open things up, the doubling time comes down. 
and then when you close things this is due to the ward closures the doubling time goes up again and so on so there's there are these huge swings that are negatively correlated with the disease uh, spread so when this is high uh, then the wards get closed and you essentially have uh, uh, smaller uh, doubling times and uh, the uh, dotted and the and the, the solid and the dash correspond to this corresponds to trains off and this corresponds to trains on in any case uh, uh, we have this particular study as well and uh, a report is uh, forthcoming so, uh, there's another study that we did which is related to what kind so, uh, of uh, this uh, 20 minutes time out is of up time. so just yeah. quickly yeah, yeah. so uh, oh, you quickly finish yeah okay so then i'll skip that uh, previous study and then i want to then highlight in uh, maybe just a minute or so uh, another way to emerge from this lockdown which kind of throws uh, uh, which uh, trusts users and empowers users to make responsible decisions and i want to highlight uh, quickly this uh, so here's the motivation for this so lockdown is essentially a top down straight jacket approach it treats all activities as equally risky uh, but then certain activities could be carried on if people take precautions and uh, the person that's making these decisions about lockdown is unclear as to what activities these are that information is available with the individual agents the individual agents on the other hand don't have a perspective of the uh, overall uh, spread of the disease in the system and how their decisions might impact the broader uh, uh, broader disease spread so this information asymmetry is a problem so why not uh, use some ideas from economics and uh, come up with the soft touch approach so the soft touch approach could be that the social planner advertises a readiness threshold if you are if your uh, particular uh, firm is ready uh, is covid ready and you, your readiness threshold is met you cross this readiness threshold then you can operate otherwise you cannot or otherwise you can take decisions to uh, meet this readiness threshold uh, on your own agents then decide once this readiness threshold is advertised the right mix for them based on their firm's objectives we think that this is likely to have greater acceptance it is also adaptive because if the uh, uh, disease is uh, uh, if the epidemic is spreading in a somewhat alarming way then you can increase the readiness threshold uh, other if things are going well then you can decrease the readiness threshold and allow more activity so just quickly uh, here is uh, um, a particular uh, readiness threshold calculator that we have so you can tell what kind of establishment yours is whether it's an it or Uh, it software park or, and so on you can also provide other details about uh, your infrastructure office infrastructure the number of employees epidemic related precautions you have taken and so on and then you can uh, there are many such things how 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 many people travel what distances uh, what kind of uh, uh, how many toilets do you have how often do you clean them what's your cafeteria pantry kitchen parameters what kind of interactions do people have in your offices and so on and then if you hit the submit button you will essentially get a readiness threshold so this is actually a readiness threshold calculation for the office that we sit in uh, and uh, so we have a readiness threshold of 751 we are very poor in cafeteria let me make this bigger we are very poor in cafeteria for example so if we take some actions here perhaps we'll meet the threshold and uh, we might be able to uh, operate and the important uh, point here is that you get some suggestions here um, which are concrete steps that the entity can take uh, to uh, increase their readiness threshold so i'll go back to my presentation and uh, maybe um, uh, end with this uh, so uh, there are some weighted uh, averages of the measures taken which uh, come up with the score uh, in some uh, in some cases for certain other things employee interactions etc we basically look at what would be the contacts for the parameters that people have input and then we estimate the doubling time of a hypothetical infection and if it is smaller than some number then uh, uh, if the doubling time is larger then we basically say that this particular firm is ready as far as that interaction space is concerned thank you thank you rajesh so we move on to the last talk. talk and then we can uh, ask go back to questions so the last talk is by harshal hayat nagarkar and uh, he will be also talking about a, another agent based model so harshal if you are ready we can start yes just sharing my screen
Can you see my screen? Okay. Yes, we can see. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so uh, thank you, Rajesh, uh, for a wonderful presentation and other presentations also. And this is the work that uh, at ThoughtWorks we are doing. This is in collaboration uh, with uh, Dr. Gautam Menon of Ashoka University. And we are sharing uh, early results from a large scale agent based simulation for greater uh, Mumbai metropolitan region. So, so we, uh, you know, just to give you a very quick primer, I think Rajesh has already covered, but uh, there are, we see there are three layers of uh, agent based simulations. Uh, the, the bottom most is the spatial data building schools, shops, offices, etc. On top of that, you have uh, environmental factors, and then you have people moving, making decisions, uh, living their daily life. And there are three ways of, uh, uh, you know, modeling from minimalist to realistic. Uh, and then there could be intermediate models also. So if we, if somebody uh, were to simulate war strategies uh, and uh, use them for learning, training and uh, other decision-making purposes, uh, you can see chess can be used as a war strategy simulation, a minimalist one. And then real-time strategy games can be used uh, where there is more dynamics and finally, you can have actual war, military war games. And all three are simulation. Uh, one simulation type uh, to, or many simulation types could be useful depending upon the purpose of any individual. So here, uh, the work that I'm going to present is uh, based upon a simulation framework we built. Uh, we call it EP Rust. It's an epidemiologic, epidemic simulation framework developed in uh, Rust programming language. It's open source. We open sourced it sometime in uh, mid to late March. Uh, it is distributed. Uh, you can simulate one or more cities with that. It follows the minimalist approach, something uh, like the chess I mentioned with representative functionality. And uh, the disease dynamics is the Mordecai SCR model that we uh, you know, already discussed. And here in this uh, simulation, the clock tick uh, is, uh, is equal to one hour. So. Uh, in case of agent-based simulation, you need to maintain your own clock as the agents are making, um, they are moving uh, in, you know, on, the, on the grid or on the geography. And uh, to, uh, usually we simulate uh, up to 10,000 ticks or 10,000 hours, which is a little more than a year. So uh, we have different agent attributes. So we have working, non-working population, mobility wise, you know, people using public or private transport. Uh, work, uh, we have three different types of work, healthcare uh, workers, uh, essential services worker, as well as uh, others. And we have modeled age and gender, but we have not used as of now. Uh, agents follow 24 hour daily routine, uh, like, uh, uh, you know, wake up in the morning, do household activities, uh, take public or private transport, go to work, uh, work there uh, for eight hours, and then come back using uh, the transport of choice. And then finally do, household activities, sleep for eight hours to wake up next day. And we also have support for a synthetic population that, uh, that is still work in progress actually. In addition to that, we, uh, our city is a grid-based geography. We have uh, uh, different areas, uh, demarcated as residential where people live, um, then workplaces, transportation, uh, which is actually public transport and hospitals. And we have modeled three uh, uh, interventions, quarantine in hospitals, city lockdown, and mass vaccination. And uh, ma mass vaccination is because we started uh, work on EPRUST uh, last year, actually. So at that time, there was, uh, you know, we, we all uh, had assumption that the vaccines could generally be available for disease spreads such as influenza and so on. And in addition to that, we have a, a transport matrix uh, for intercity uh, transportation. This is not a commute. Uh, where it is not like people uh, start in the morning, uh, go to the office and then come back in the evening. This is travel where they move to a uh, different city and they may stay there for um, more, definitely more than one day. And the sh schedule is 24 hours. Uh, it's a unimodal. So we are not differentiating between uh, different modes uh, such as rail, road or air. And then lockdown intervention, we have uh, zero movements in the lockdown except that essential services are permitted along with uh, some movement of uh, healthcare personnel. In addition to that, we also uh, take into account leakage. Leakage as in people who are moving across, but they do not belong to either of these two services. And which could mean that 
uh, they could be source of infection. So this is generally the minimalist approach, like I was mentioning, of a typical city. You have uh, the housing area, which is in light yellow color, and all the blue dots on them. These are the people uh, staying there. Uh, and then there is the pink area, which is work and transport area, which is light orange, and then hospital area, which is light blue, and then other area, which can be used for hospital expansion and other things, uh, other purposes, perhaps. Uh, there, are, there are some other usages we have in mind that I will discuss uh, towards the end of this presentation. This is the Mordecai SCR model that uh, uh, already uh, Gautam discussed, and we are following the same one. Uh, no, no change there. So to simulate uh, COVID-19 spread over the greater Mumbai metropolitan region, we try to model it and we have uh, some early results as early as today morning itself. And this is the greater Mumbai region. And the model setup is such that uh, uh, what we do actually is we try to simulate each and every individual in the city living their life. Uh, and then the way uh, the, the, each city can have a large number of individuals now, because of the computational resources needed to simulate a large city, uh, we have typically seen uh, when a city, uh, you know, population is below 5 million, we are able to uh, simulate it pretty nicely. Uh, 5 million is where we start seeing some, um, uh, some hiccups uh, in terms of execution times and so on. So Mumbai population being much larger than 5 million, what we thought uh, to, di to divide the entire uh, uh, population of Mumbai into uh, ward wise and each ward can be simulated as a city and uh, for each ward uh, we have a relative uh, sizing for the population density which means the densest uh, most dense uh, region of the uh, uh, ward of the Mumbai uh, that will become the uh, size one and then as it becomes sparser and sparser then we uh, create uh, you know larger and larger grids for that. Uh, we tried to simulate a scenario with lockdown only. Uh, so we have a transport network that by which uh, the wards can, uh, uh, you know, people in different wards, they can move from one part to another part. But the way because of the, uh, the communication framework we are using, uh, the commute framework would choke up the uh, distributed uh, messaging framework. So we decided to start with a lockdown scenario. And uh, here in this case, uh, you know, all the wards are under lockdown, only health and essential services uh, are possible within and across wards. So people can move uh, from one end of the city to a, or uh, from one ward to another remote ward uh, and so on. There is leakage which is factored in people movement across adjacent wards, uh, but, uh, but not necessarily moving uh, to remote wards. And then there is uh, inter-ward transport network uh, that essentially, like I said, does not represent the commute. The healthcare workers stay uh, at hospitals for two weeks uh, and then they come back to their home ward and lockdown is lifted uh, under a condition that there are zero cases for three weeks uh, continuously. So under these conditions, we try to simulate a lockdown scenario within Mumbai. And uh, we are also currently, as of now, we are working uh, on scenario without interventions, no hospitalization, people movement within ward and so on. I think that will take some time for us to get the result. So the input parameters were synthetic population, uh, approximately 12 million agents, 1.2 crore agents we created uh, using ward-based census data uh, and then relative grid sizing uh, based on the population density and mobility for, for that, uh, uh, like I said, people using only uh, uh, transport for uh, essential and healthcare workers and no commute. And for disease dynamics, the transmission start day, uh, we assumed as it starts on day five, end of infection for severely infected people is 26, end of infection for mildly infected uh, patients would be 12, and end, for, uh, end of uh, infection for asymptomatic people who do not show any symptoms whatsoever is nine. And with other, uh, the, uh, these details, uh, we, we, uh, we concluded the disease dynamics uh, and then we wanted to uh, choose a date. Uh, a date, 13th April, gave us all the necessary de details such as infections per ward, uh, which we seeded, and then uh, ours, uh, that was the setup with which we ran the lockdown scenario. So these are the uh, early results. Uh, this is an animated GIF uh, where you can see the infection is spreading so slowly. And... Uh, we have simulated close to uh, 
10,000 hours of the simulation. And you can also see some of the regions are becoming greener as well. So based upon this, uh, we thought, uh, uh, why not to have a look at some of the recent details that uh, BMC, uh, Brihan Mumbai uh, Municipal Corporation has uh, uh, shared. So these are, there is a report, progress report. Uh, so as of 7th of May, uh, we see there are some close to 8,784 active cases uh, here. And uh, from the simulation, we could see that there are 8,116 active cases. The number of recovered are more uh, in our case, 3,500. There is total recovered here are uh, 2,435. Of course, these are very early results and uh, we, are, we have just started uh, simulating this for the disease dynamics because all other components are in place now. And this is the interactive dashboard that uh, we typically use to uh, slice and dice across uh, uh, various parts, how the, how the data is moving from, uh, how, how, the, how the infections are moving from uh, you know, one region to another region, how they, are, how they are spreading. So in addition to that, uh, uh, you know, myself being a computer scientist, I would like to share some technical discussion. Uh, some of you may, uh, uh, you know, may find it useful. So the current architecture is such that we use, uh, uh, you know, an Apache Kafka, which is, uh, which is the uh, communication backbone. And then each ward has uh, its own uh, engine, uh, what we call uh, the Epirust engine. And these Epirust engine, they need to be uh, synchronized uh, for, uh, for their own clock because each uh, ward has to have its own clock. And then there is a vector clock synchronizer uh, that keeps track of uh, how, the, how, the, uh, how each engine is maintaining the clocks. And, Typically, 24 hours uh, uh, the synchronization happens uh, because of these uh, vector clock synchronizer. In addition to that, uh, we we are uh, the, the current EPIRST code. It uses only single core, but we have implemented it, uh, with what is called as mechanical sympathy, uh, such that uh, the code is written by understanding the internals of computer architecture, the underlying processor, and uh, so that we try to keep the uh, the loops very, very tight to each other so that it uses memory locality and so on. We also use some uh, SIMD data parallel instructions so that uh, the data structure access and data structure manipulation time can be minimized. And so basically if somebody uh, may be curious to know why we chose Rust, uh, we had three goals. One is performance. Um, the second one is flexibility and third one is robustness. So perform we uh, via Rust programming language, which came from Mozilla, uh, the Firefox makers. Uh, it offers performance comparable to C and C++, but without the overhead of explicit memory management, which typically becomes source of many uh, errors, uh, difficult to uh, find out, uh, difficult to discover and later mitigate. In addition to that, uh, it offers robustness of other well-known languages such as Java and Go, uh, which have the overhead of run times, uh, which Rust does not have. And in addition to that, their, uh, Rust is very flexible because it supports object-oriented and functional paradigm. It also supports fearless concurrency as a design philosophy, which is very important as you would like to run it on multiple cores and multiple machines. And uh, for example, just to give you a sense of performance, our first implementation of uh, uh, the epidemic model was uh, on gamma platform, uh, which is very popular for uh, prototyping and so on. And uh, for, uh, so the dynamics was smallpox dynamics that we had last year. And uh, it took uh, 60 minutes on the 100 plus cores of a large server uh, for 10,000 agents. Whereas Epirus finishes for 10,000 agents uh, within less than a minute on a single core of a laptop. So till now highest, we could simulate 50 million agents across uh, 10 virtual cities of 5 million each. Uh, and we are hoping that we will be able to scale uh, beyond that as well. So Epirust is still work in progress. Uh, we are adding lots of features. Uh, so household information to form families, for example, in synthetic population. Uh, this is something an ongoing work. Uh, we are also trying to add shared spaces such as shops and markets. Uh, we are trying to incorporate age and comorbidity into the Mordecai model if possible. Uh, various what if scenarios for imposing and lifting lockdown. Uh, that is uh, another work in progress. Uh, then uh, looking at the various news reports and uh, trends, 
uh, we had uh, anticipated uh, earlier as well that reverse migration could become a problem as it has become so we would like to model that uh, in addition to that we think uh, this is a, a human behavior models is going to be an orthogonal uh, you know model for for many other things basically whether it is compliance or uh, spoke or uh, reverse migration and so on commute uh, transportation network uh, effect of using uh, ppes and masks for healthcare staff as well as general populace uh, herd immunity we, we are interested in simulating and finally uh, trying to so, so we try to generate a lot of data that can be consumed by an outbreak analytics package and so on so what do we need in order to achieve this and beyond we would uh, desire to have a ward level census data across india that would go into synthetic population or synthetic information um, kind of uh, uh, package uh, gis data including residential roads offices hospitals and so on hospital details specifically such as scheduled beds how many are available icus are there any specializations such as ventilators and so on uh, clinical cases uh, details uh, within india and elsewhere so that we can actually precisely compute the uh, disease dynamics probabilities uh, and other effects using machine learning and other data science techniques uh, commute data for synthetic information again migration data and then we all of course need community of users who would uh, try epirest and then give their feedback if they find it useful or not and uh, if they don't find it useful even we would like to hear even that from them <clears throat> and next in the evolution in this line uh, we are looking at bharat sim it is the first ultra large scale simulation for entire india it's a research collaboration with uh, dr gautam and the scope is much beyond uh, epirest the bharat sim will have its own identities so epirest and bharat sim will coexist uh, so so when we are seeing pan uh, india scope it is the complexity of the geography the population climates because each region has its own microclimate and so on uh, going beyond epidemiology it could mean that uh, economic policies and then climate change policies and so on and unlike uh, if rest uh, bharat sim is going to be based on gis and other related data so i think uh, what we are trying to uh, share is uh, uh, you know this based upon the philosophy all models are wrong some are useful so we are trying to help build a framework uh, that can uh, you know help researchers to build useful models and um i presented this on behalf of uh, my team uh, uh, engineering for research uh, where we exclusively collaborate with uh, research organizations and uh, you are most welcome to write to us and you are most welcome to try if you rest thank you so much thanks a lot harshal so maybe we take a couple of questions for harshal and rajesh so one question was how realistic are the models in incorporating city information so heterogeneity in the city Uh, landscape in the terms of uh, po population density households and so on and also about informal sector and formal sector so rajesh should you like to take that yes so um, uh, we take into account the uh, population density in each of the wards and so households are instantiated based on the census data that we have uh, so that's uh, it's it's faithful uh, to that extent so there was a question from i think atiyab zafar on uh, whether we uh, take into account apartment complexes and uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. uh, other households we don't do that it's not to that level of granularity but when we know that there are this many number of households in the city we put them uh, in that particular ward they are all located in that ward so a 1 lakh city with an average of four people per household means that there are 25000 households they are all placed uh, uh, in some way in this ward now uh, what we do take into account is uh, if the particular ward has a very high population density so there is a population density parameter this is something that you can uh, tune then the contacts there are likely to be at a much higher rate so you can essentially provide a higher contact rate parameter for that uh, so in mumbai for example in every ward mumbai's wards are mumbai has only 24 wards whereas bangalore has 198 wards so mumbai is a lot more uh, uh, larger ward so what we have done is uh, we have basically uh, uh, divided each ward into a high density zone and a low density zone so effectively there are 48 wards and then you can have a high density parameter for the contacts in that particular zone so did that answer all the questions that you posed uh, 
at least for our simulator. Uh, about the formal sector and informal sector. Yes. That, that kind yeah. Of so the census cool. data, the census data also gives information about how many people are employed. Now this employment data takes into account the formal sector and the informal sector. They have different kind of contacts. The formal contact is there is an office that is there and so on. The informal contact is a little different. It might be uh, some household help or it might be uh, uh, maybe deliveries of some kind and so on. So uh, we have not taken the informal, uh, we, have, we don't have a very refined model of the informal sector. We just view it as this many people are being employed and then they are instantiated in appropriate offices based on the uh, office size distribution and the data that we have. So that means that we, might, we would instantiate more number of offices and think of these informal sector employments as um, offices of a similar type. That's of course not true, but this is the best that we could do. Thank you. So Harshal, I'll throw the other question at you. So what about healthcare preparedness in locally? So do you take that into account into the model about infrastructure and uh, doctors, etc, etc? Et yeah, so we have a hospital and we have model hospital and healthcare workers. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the way we have currently modeled is uh, uh, for each ward uh, in Mumbai region, there are a designated number of like 2% of healthcare workers. And now for their preparedness, uh, such as PPE uh, and other equipments necessary, that's something uh, which is on our to-do list. Uh, we are we are making some progress towards that. What about, uh, do you have information about how many hospitals are there in India neighborhood or how many clinics and so on? Does that information go? Uh, no, uh, uh, as of today, the model uh, cannot consume uh, this information, uh, but we are trying to uh, you know, make some progress in that direction. Okay, so thank you. So maybe we just uh, move on to some panel discussion in the sense of some broader questions that we would like to address. So some of the questions that basically come up, came up during the chat also and some that we have been grappling with. So all of these models require data. So how much of data is available and what uh, the modelers feed uh, should be available uh, to make uh, good uh, modeling and also good predictions and so on. And the broader question is how, as a modeling community, how do we contribute to the epidemic uh, uh, mitigation in the country? How realistic are the models? What do we expect from these models? What not to expect? So for example, people got scared when people, uh, there were some projections about millions of people dying. Is that realistic? There are a lot of pessimism about this compartmental model. So uh, maybe some people can comment on that. And then there's also the question of how, whether deterministic models are good enough and should one uh, look at stochastic models. So uh, some words about these models, if some of you can comment. And other question, other question is about herd immunity. So this is a term that is being thrown around uh, quite a lot. And uh, so uh, local or global, so that, uh, should we think about local herd immunity or should one think about herd immunity on a la larger length scale or geographical scale? And do models help us in uh, understanding or uh, achieving this kind of uh, herd immunity or the time scales involved? So maybe some of you, uh, the panelists, can respond to this. So Gautam, would you like to take up some of these questions? Yeah, just a sec. Let me just share my screen. Can you see my screen? Can yeah. I see? Okay, at least to the second question that you raised, I mean, that's an important one, because one question that as modelers, we are asked a lot of the time is to what extent are you just playing games with models and to what extent is what you're doing useful in terms of, of, of planning, of national planning, of, of working on a really tight time scale to be able to actually be meaningful in terms of what you're trying to do. So that's something for us who work as modelers to consider at what level of what we what we are doing it, is it relevant? And I've also been asked recently about the fact that there are many people, there are many models floating around, let's say at least about 20 or 30 of them that people have written down. Is there one set of models around which the community can coalesce on in order that government is not faced with the need to look at 20 different models to try and figure out what's the detail, what is the difference between model one and 10 or 12 or 13, because it has no one to sort of advise it at this point. So what's on my screen is just a quick 
run through of different types of models that people have been talking about. So we've seen a whole lot of deterministic epidemiological compartmental models of which Incisim is the one that I've been involved in most closely and I think has the right requisite level of detail to be a fast deterministic thing. It's a sort of point of first entry if you want to ask a quick question about what might work, what might not work. Then there are the agent-based models which come later, which have a whole lot of complexity built into them. And they're complicated, they're hard to write, they, they, they require a fair amount of expertise that is not really necessary for someone who's skilled with, with numerical methods to, to figure out how to write, how to code up eight PDs, actually eight coupled ODs in, in, in a suitable form. It's really there, the epidemiology is important to determining in what you want to achieve. But there's stuff in the middle that we're not paying enough attention to. And I want to put it out that we haven't seen any Gillespie-based models. And I think that this is the next frontier for people who work on deterministic compartmental models to think about. And this, I think, should be the next direction for people who are working with the um, insights and initiative to think about that now that a large chunk of that work is already over, we should be moving to seeing how we can make that put to capacity. And the advantage with Gillespie-based models is exactly as Mukund pointed out, the nature of the progression of the disease is more complex than the simple exponential time scale that an automatic simple rate equation approach gives you. You can put in the levels of the disease in, in a better description of the disease at that point. You can also put in complex network structures in terms of social interaction. You don't quite have the geographic way that, that agent-based models are able to deal with it, the underlying geographic information that you can do with agents and where people stay, where people work, etc. But this might be a, a somewhere in between where there is a gap and where one should work. The other point that I really want to emphasize is statistical models and data analysis. We have essentially not very statistical approaches that are deep and targeted to the sort of problem that we have. There's huge amounts of potentially underreporting, bad data coming out of government, stuff people don't seem to trust the government numbers anymore. They seem to be looking more at the aggregated information that people seem to be picking up from newspaper reports, from state reports, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So can we develop better statistical methods? So we need more epidemiologists, statisticians, health economists, sociologists, so large, this group is largely a group of physicists, applied mathematicians, engineers, computer scientists. But at some point, we have reached a stage where the input that we need must come from outside the field. That's again something, a point that I wanted to raise, and but particularly to stress the need to come behind one set of models of each type, a, a deterministic model, a stochastic model, and an agent-based model that can function at different scales with different people involved in them. And we can say that, look, this is the one that we trust as a community to be able to be helpful in predicting the future course of the disease. Yeah, sorry, that's, that's all I had to say. Could I add something to that? This is uh, uh, Mukun. Yeah, sure. I was going to ask you. So, carry so on. Um, um, in addition to, of course, I agree with every point that Gautam just uh, mentioned. And it's it, it, uh, very carefully thought through. So um, I can't emphasize how much I agree with what was just said. Um, so I have, I have one other piece to add. So I think um, I, would, I think we can all agree that uh, it's not the models that are going to save us in the end. Um, it's uh, what happens on the ground. It's the people in the hospitals. It's the biology of vaccines and so on and so forth. Um, and if that's the case, then what is the role of the model? And Gautam emphasized the predictive role. I think the complementary role models serve are explanatory roles. They look back and tell us what we have been through and tell us which um, uh, ingredients uh, of the real world are relevant and which ones are marginal and which ones are irrelevant. Um, and that type of looking back post facto uh, explanatory power is then used and integrated into other ways of thinking going forward. Right. So. If a model is so complicated that you can't even understand the model, then I think it serves no purpose. So what we should do with the model is try and understand why they are doing what they are doing. Okay, thanks Mukun for your thoughts. Anybody else wants to pitch in from among the panelists? So I want to add to the last point of uh, what what is present in the model is also probably present in the thought. On one end, we said what will happen on the ground. But question is, so whether it be policymaker or modeler, are migrant workers present in our mind space? Uh, is a hand wash, whatever we, our uh, recommendation are for physical distance, distancing or hand washing, or this whole concept of lockdown, how long, when we say, oh, two year lockdown, <coughs> even to utter that phrase, two year lockdown, what does it mean to the lives of the people? Or even for the two year, even two month lockdown, which all of us have been doing, but what does it mean? What does it does to the people? Uh, so in that 
that sense, the importance of a model is in also in what all it does not talk about and what all it uh, talks about. And I think that aspect is what I'm, I'm also. I'm there no easy answer. I'm just raising question. I also uh, don't have an answer. But that we must be aware of that and we must emphasize that. And that our model suggests lockdown as an intervention. If, because if that's all our models can do, and of course there are a lot of models here which do a lot of different things. I'm not, but I'm just saying that, that the solutions suggested should be very clear that there are a lot of the disclaimers should come in the beginning, not at the end. That there are a lot of things that can be done that are important to be done, but our models can't do it. But and therefore that that list of things suggested is necessarily in, not just incomplete; it can be dangerously incomplete at times. So that and. And some of the things I mentioned earlier, how to uh, I mean take care of that. So at a very broad level, rural urban divide, and also within the cities and the elite and the population, <coughs> or which in a city like Bombay can be very stark, or I mean in most of our cities. Uh, so how do we model that? And when when we give suggestion, especially or anything, what what does it mean for I mean people in Dharavi or in Mumbai to do do certain thing, or what should policy maker do or administrator do? So, so there was the issue of homogeneity and heterogeneity came, but I think at least there are just two binaries: rural, urban, where the urban be, uh, rural behavior may be very different, the pollution level is different, population density is different, the contact matrix is different. Rural, urban divide, I think, should be uh, paid more, and within city, then uh, so the urban poor and rural poor, their response and risk both may be dramatic, are dramatically different, which is something that's uh, currently. Can okay, the, Anup Krishnan here. Can I yeah, add a few on. points to this? Sure, sure. Anup, carry on. Yeah, hi, I'm uh, Anup Krishnan from IIT Delhi. So uh, I, I completely agree with the points that have been, uh, you know, that was discussed by uh, uh, Professor Gautam Menon, Mukun Tattai, Om Damani. Uh, from my perspective, uh, let me let me give you a slightly different perspective on this. Uh, I am a civil engineer. Okay? So my only connection to biology is that my wife did a PhD in neuroscience. Uh, that's, my, that's my only connection to biology. Uh, but what happened is that when this COVID happened, you know, somebody came to me and said, is there anything that you think you can do? Because ultimately, these are some differential equations and people work on differential equations. You work on differential equations. And we do it on a daily basis. So that's how we started this work. And when we started this, I echo with uh, Professor Rajesh Sundaration that uh, you know we did not start this work with the aim of getting three papers out of it or uh, you know some producing some papers out of it. Uh, that was never the aim. Can we can we do something which which is going to help people um, disseminate the information better and give some suggestive indicative suggestions as to this is what is going to happen. This, is, this was our intention. And uh, now, after going through the symposium, I see that most of the people have ventured into this with the same, uh, with the same intention. And I think, as a, as a community, one thing that is actionable, uh, I would like to add that I don't think we will have ever an agreement on what is the right model, or is there a single model that's going to predict everything. I don't think we will have an agreement on that, because everybody will have their own pet model, and they'll keep continuing to work uh, work with uh, that model and I, I think that's fine because that's how science works we all have our own ideas and we try to develop that idea further and and uh, time will you know the, the test of time will tell us which is the best model but i think uh, uh, a more important thing is that it has essentially created a body of knowledge uh, that different people are thinking and different thoughts have come in the direction and it's i think uh, as a community we should think beyond covid I mean, COVID is one thing that initiated this. And I, I think that's a very good uh, initiative that we have come together at COVID. But I think the implications of this work is much beyond COVID. And it can be applied to many other infectious diseases. So I think one of the major things as a community that we can do is combine the knowledge that we have uh, documented uh, and make it accessible to everybody. For example, I see that. Uh, most of the people, many of them have made their code open source. Even we have made our code open source. Everybody can go to our paper and click on the GitHub link. You will get the link to all the codes. And we are sharing it on a web page also. We, we made the web page just with the intention that everybody will be able to you know, kind of access this information, which is otherwise not easy. Because getting an R0 value is not easy from, uh, from a perspective of a common, per common person. 
this is the this is the whole idea of uh, doing this so towards an actionable outcome can we think of something like that where in you know all the knowledge is put together you know in in different compartments one is data make the data available because i think a lot of us have a lot of data that's combined because the models are using a lot of testing data a lot of incidence data we have a lot of district wise data and even testing data so can we come up with uh, you know two three points like this for example all the models will be made available everybody can test it all the data will be made available everybody can test it and then probably people who are already working in this area and who want to take it forward uh, can they you know suggest how to extend this to other infectious diseases like maybe malaria malaria is a big issue in india and uh, uh, many other such diseases uh, because we are going to have now many more cases that are going to happen with this so this is just uh, my thought from my side that's so, it thank you okay i have yeah, a point to make anup. because we now yeah. sorry anup we uh, sorry we are just running out of time we just no, will be kicked out basically by zoom right 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 yeah thank you <laughs> this is so rajesh sundarajan can i make a couple of yeah, points yeah rajesh yeah. one so we have you have one minute because at 1630 we are going i mean 630 will be kicked off okay so we so, have a hard limit yeah I, i think we have done quite a bit of uh, uh, epidemiological modeling and some statistics and data analysis it's time to bring the economists and the sociologists so i echo uh, the point that uh, gautam menon made i also think that we must uh, come up with uh, more ingenious uh, uh, strategies and think about uh, empowering people to make responsible decisions and uh, perhaps come up with methodologies by which we can um, have uh, more activity go on uh, and uh, uh, still manage the uh, lockdown but or manage the uh, redu- reduction in contacts and i think lockdown is not the way uh, but perhaps uh, greater awareness education and also uh, actions that people could take so if we could bring in sociologists in uh, uh, at this uh, moment it's it would be very helpful in our studies thank you so thanks rajesh in fact uh, isrc's entire in, uh, effort is to bring in people from different fields and we are continuing to do this effort to bring in people from i mean we are all coming from mathematical backgrounds in the sciences so but also in social sciences we would like to interact and this process is continuing so one thing i would just like to mention before finishing that uh, we plan to have a series of this kind of panel discussions based uh, on on the topic of modeling and data analysis and so on so we want to have another one soon maybe in a week's time so we'll let you know also if you uh, get to know about modeling efforts please uh, bring it to our notice so that we can invite the people so that there are more uh, thoughts and ideas to be shared and also we would like to uh, have a white paper or a, a summary document at the end which sort of summarizes what are the different efforts that are going on in different uh, groups and so on so that there is a coherent bed of knowledge that anup was mentioning that people can act upon and so on so we have to end now because we are really run out of time so thanks to jasjeet and the team at icer mohali for uh, helping us to host this meeting and we hope to see you soon in the next edition of this symposium so thanks a lot for joining thank you thank you thank you bye thank you bye thank you thank you so much thank you